milenial merupakan kunci pembangunan. Berdasarkan data proyeksi penduduk Indonesia 2015-2045, di tahun 2030, 25,5 persen penduduk Indonesia merupakan generasi milenial, dan 13,7 persennya merupakan lansia. Tahukah Anda bahwa tak hanya milenial, lansia juga bisa menjadi kunci pembangunan? Lansia? Kok bisa? Yuk kita lihat lebih dalam. Di tahun 2045, jumlah lansia akan menjadi tiga kali lipat dibandingkan tahun 2015. Dengan jumlah yang sebesar itu, lansia menjadi sangat potensial jika aktif dan produktif. Hasil survei menunjukkan bahwa 7 dari 10 lansia di Indonesia bahagia. Dan lansia yang aktif berpeluang dua kali mengaku lebih bahagia dibanding lansia yang tidak aktif. Untuk itu, lansia bisa aktif dengan cara berolahraga seperti senam atau melakukan kegiatan lain seperti memasak, berkebun, bahkan bermain musik. Lansia juga masih bisa tetap produktif dengan caranya sendiri. Misalnya, dengan cara membagikan pengalaman hidup, mengajarkan keterampilan yang dimiliki, ataupun dengan tetap bekerja. Menjadi lansia bukan berarti ketinggalan zaman. Faktanya, sekitar 4 dari 10 lansia bisa mengakses teknologi menggunakan handphone. Dengan kemampuan berteknologi, lansia bisa lebih mandiri dalam melakukan kegiatan sehari-hari. Misalnya, aktif mencari informasi, memesan ojek online, berbelanja, dan lain sebagainya. Di Indonesia, angka harapan hidup semakin meningkat dari 45 tahun di tahun 1971 menjadi 73 untuk laki-laki dan 77 untuk perempuan di tahun 2045. Sayangnya, usia panjang tersebut tak selalu diiringi dengan kondisi kesehatan yang baik. Satu dari empat lansia sakit dalam sebulan terakhir. Selain rentan sakit, lansia juga rentan terhadap kemiskinan loh. terutama jika tidak terlindungi program jaminan sosial seperti jaminan kesehatan dan jaminan ketenaga kerjaan. Satu dari tiga penduduk masih belum memiliki jaminan kesehatan dan hanya 15% pekerja yang tercakup dalam kepesertaan jaminan pensiun. Untuk menghindari risiko sakit dan miskin, pemerintah menyusun strategi nasional kelanjut usiaan sebagai upaya mewujudkan lansia yang mandiri, sejahtera, dan bermartabat. Upaya ini bukan hanya tugas pemerintah, tetapi juga perlu dukungan dari kita semua. Kita dapat mempersiapkan diri dengan membekali diri dengan keahlian, gaya hidup sehat, tabungan hari tua, dan lingkungan yang mendukung. Yang terakhir, jangan lupa untuk belajar memahami dan menghormati lansia di sekitar kita ya. Yuk, wujudkan lansia yang mandiri, sejahtera, dan bermartabat mulai dari sekarang. Kalau milenial dan lansia bisa sama-sama aktif dan produktif, Indonesia bisa menjadi negara maju loh. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen from all over the world. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you. My name is Radis Meshofira, and I will be your MC for today. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of the National Development Planning of Indonesia, or BAPNAS, ADB, and AREA, I am delighted to welcome all of you to this international webinar. The New Normal Elderly Life and Care Post-COVID-19. This event is specially hosted by the Director of Poverty Alleviation and Social Welfare Bapenas in commemorating the 24 National Elderly Day. Selamat siang, selamat pagi Bapak dan Ibu semua dimanapun Bapak dan Ibu berada. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Perkenalkan, nama saya Radis Meshofira dan saya akan menjadi MC pada hari ini. Atas nama perwakilan dari Bapenas, EDB dan Erya, saya menghaturkan terima kasih atas partisipasi Bapak dan Ibu yang telah bergabung di dalam webinar ini. Selamat datang Bapak dan Ibu, terima kasih banyak. 
webinar ini diselenggarakan di dalam uh, dalam rangka memperingati hari lanjut usia nasional yang ke-24 di tahun 2020. So ladies and gentlemen, before we start, I'd like to give you some information. The translation service is available in this web uh, in this webinar. You can choose your audio channel by clicking the interpretation uh, feature, the globe symbol, as you can see um, at the bottom on your Zoom screen. If you need Bahasa um, to, uh, if you need to hear the translation from Bahasa to the English translation, please click the English button. And if you need to hear uh, English uh, to Bahasa Indonesia translation, please click uh, the Japanese button. Or if you don't need any translation, you can just turn it off. And second, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to apologize because of the number of the registering participants has reached um, the maximum capacity. Therefore, there will be some of the participants who can't uh, join us in this room meeting. For you who can uh, not uh, join us in this room meeting, please go to our official YouTube channel at Bapenas RE. It is live streaming now. And today's presentations, for all the materials of today's presentation, you can download it uh, in, the link, uh, in the link we have given to you at the background, uh, at the number three. And also, all of the participants can ask your questions through Slido with the hashtag ElderlyWebinar. And finally, we'd like to ask your help to fill a survey after this webinar ends. And in this survey, you can request um, uh, for your certificate of participation. Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, uh, terima kasih sebelum acara dimulai. Izinkan saya memberikan sedikit informasi bahwa uh, Webinar ini uh, diselenggarakan di dalam dua bahasa. Bapak dan Ibu dapat mengaktifkan fitur translasi uh, dengan simbol bola dunia di bawah seperti yang Bapak dan Ibu dapat lihat pada Zoom screen. Apabila Bapak dan Ibu ingin mengaktifkan uh, translasi dari bahasa Indonesia ke dalam bahasa Inggris, silakan klik tombol Inggris. Uh, apabila Bapak dan Ibu ingin uh, mengkonversi atau mendengarkan translasi dari bahasa Inggris ke dalam bahasa Indonesia, silakan klik uh, pilihan Japanese. Dan apabila Bapak dan Ibu tidak membutuhkan translasi, maka silakan dimatikan saja fitur tersebut. Lalu kami juga ingin meminta maaf karena keterbatasan ruang di dalam Zoom Meeting, ada beberapa peserta yang tidak dapat bergabung di sini. Oleh karena itu, Bapak dan Ibu dapat menyaksikan keseluruhan acara ini di dalam dalam uh, melalui live streaming uh, di kanal official YouTube Bapak Nas. Lalu juga seluruh materi pada presentasi hari ini dapat Bapak dan Ibu download uh, pada link yang telah kami sediakan. Uh, di belakang saya sudah ada uh, link-nya. Lalu juga Bapak dan Ibu dapat berpartisipasi baik yang bergabung di dalam Zoom Meeting maupun uh, live streaming melalui YouTube uh, dengan uh, mengajukan pertanyaan melalui Slido dengan hashtag ElderlyWebinar. Dan yang terakhir, saya ingin meminta kesediaan Bapak dan Ibu untuk berkenan mengisi post survey yang akan Bapak dan Ibu dan uh, yang akan Bapak dan Ibu temukan uh, setelah acara ini selesai. Uh, dan di dalam survei tersebut, Bapak dan Ibu juga dapat mengajukan permintaan untuk mendapatkan sertifikat atas partisipasi hari ini. So, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has reached Indonesia, and since March 2020, uh, the central and the local governments have applied the quarantine policies in many forms and at various degrees. Uh, it has impacted the elderly uh, generations in many aspects of life, their personal life, their economic situation, and their health status. Uh, so, so, so that, um, therefore, uh, this webinar uh, aims to bring together the policymakers, the program implementers, um, the development partners, and the academics to discuss uh, the well-being of the older generations um, in the new life during and after uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, ladies and gentlemen, participants and excellencies, now we are uh, going to the next agenda. We are now going to listen to the opening remarks given by the Deputy Minister of National Development Planning for Population and Labor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Punky Sumadi.
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, especially the international speakers, discussions, and audience on the international webinar with the topic on the new normal, elderly life and care post COVID-19. I'm very happy that I'm going to give you the opening remark of this uh, important um, event because uh, we are going to have the International Elderly Day and that we are now in the pandemic situation. So I think it is very uh, good time to talk about how we deal with the issues of um, COVID-19 uh, with relation with the elderly. Well, actually I have my own mother who is about now 81 years old. So I know uh, the situation of her condition now and not only my mother, but also the elderly as we speak in general, especially those with the chronic conditions have a higher risk of uh, being contaminated by the uh, COVID-19. Not only physical uh, risk that they are having, but also mental health risk. Because actually sometimes um, being isolated and being lonely is very difficult for them. Yeah, and older people who are in the quarantine with extended family members, usually they lost their peer groups. They cannot get in touch with the friends physically, but they can only uh, go through the uh, social media, cell phones, internet, things like that. But somehow uh, we need to understand that actually the level of sensitivity in selecting the information from the, from the social media uh, is different from what we can do now. So somehow actually in lots of the situation that I know, lots of the elderly always go to me and ask uh, Punky, is this true or not? And well, whether can, I can uh, believe the story or not, or the news uh, or not. So this is actually the situation that I'm dealing uh, with every day. Uh, previous studies have shown that actually the quarantine increased the risk of depression and other mental health problems, and the chance was considerably higher among the elderly. So uh, by understanding this risk, I think there is a new way for us to really uh, able how to approach uh, uh, our elderly around us and then provide the best uh, companionship, friendship, and whatever advice uh, that we can give to them. And on the other hand, we also understand that the elderly also lost jobs and economic security. And it is not easy for them that actually the situation does not allow them to communicate and get better access to whatever services that they can have during normal life. Indonesia is, is uh, uh, doing what we can do best to uh, help the elderly. We are now in the, not the number of our elderly is about 9.4% of the Indonesian population. It's about 26 million people, close to the whole uh, population of Malaysia. And in Yogyakarta area, for example, uh, the number of the uh, elderly is about 18%. So this is actually one of the few provinces that will have a very early aging population. And also, uh, I need to mention that in Yogyakarta, the life expectancy is also increasing every year. So that's another complexity that we are having in part of that uh, uh, region. Informality among the elderly is also high. It's about 10.5% of the elderly have the pension coverage. And it's about 25% of the older people belong to the vulnerable families and currently receive government social assistance. We have many social assistance programs uh, ongoing, but the, the access of the elderly to this program is not as wide as we expect them to have. And about the elderly care, we are still also very lacking. According to the data that we have from the Ministry of Social Affairs, we have about 930 organizations dealing with elderly, both private and public, but the coverage of the elderly being in the surface is about 200,000, less than 1% of the elderly population. So given that this, we have the, the condition, we have the data, we have the situation, 
what we do about the elderly uh, care system, uh, we put into two categories. Short term, during the uh, pandemic of the current COVID situation, our response is that actually we expand the social assistance program. We have the conditional cash transfers. We include the uh, service for the elderly within this program. We also increase the benefit, the amount of benefit uh, uh, for them, for the beneficiaries. Uh, not only the amount, but also the frequency. Usually we pay the benefit of every three or four months. Now we pay it every month. So the beneficiaries, including the elderly, will get the benefit as often as uh, uh, we can expect them to have. And we also have the uh, Sembako or the food subsidy program. It's a new program that we increase also the benefit and also the coverage from uh, last year we provided to for about uh, 10 million uh, uh, families. Now we increase into 20 million uh, families with the discussion that we will increase it into 29 million uh, families. And in addition to that, we provide also the unconditional cash transfers or any other in-kind uh, 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 transfer uh, that the government uh, provides to them. Now, having said about the short-term programs for the elderly uh, during the pandemic uh, situation here, now for the long-term program, uh, we have prepared the national strategy on the elderly uh, care system. Uh, we are now uh, going into the stage of the piloting the early, uh, elderly care system, including long-term care and other social care programs for healthier older people, in, I think in Bali, Yogyakarta, and Jakarta. We also have started the elderly information system, which is a platform for universal elderly database to support the elderly care system that we are going to have in the near future. From this uh, information system, um, we have about 9.7% of the elderly Indonesians that needs the long-term care. The majority are about more than 70 years old. And of course, we are uh, focusing on women as well. So 12% of them actually do not have caregiver. So this is actually a problem we, uh, that we are having now. And it also suggests that the high rate of depression among the elderly even before COVID-19 is also high. So this is actually the situation that we are having now, given that actually we do not have sufficient caregiver. We are also thinking how we can improve the uh, nursing educational system uh, related with the uh, vocational education system that we may have a better caregiving system for the elderly in the near future. And we also reform the social protection system uh, through better data collection and the application of adaptive social protection so that our social protection programs in the future will be able to adapt themselves and deal with the situation with any major, uh, with any, uh, major uh, disaster that we have, including uh, health disaster like we are having now. So having said that, actually I give you the situation of the pandemic situation, how we are doing uh, with the uh, situation now and what is our uh, national strategy for the short term and long term on the elderly care. I think the webinar is a very opportune time that we are having now and I would like to welcome you all on this uh, webinar and then listen to the various issues that you can uh, discuss and once again thank you very much for joining the webinar and enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pungke Sumadi, for the opening remarks. Um, so ladies and gent gentlemen, before we continue to our next agenda, I'd like to remind you that you can participate and ask your questions through Slido, slide.do with the hashtag elderly webinar. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are now continuing to the main session. The discussion session will be moderated by Ms. Silwin Ang, General Manager of Aging Asia of Singapore. Ms. Ang is an Indonesian who has lived in Singapore for close to 20 years. She holds an honors in Bachelor of Management from the University of London. She has 15 years of experience in building partnerships and report with various top decision makers.
Since joining Aging Asia in 2012, Ms. Ang has been actively engaging in discussions with key industry stakeholders and constantly kept updated on the latest trends in Asia Pacific's aging market. So ladies and gentlemen, we are now having Ms. Ang and all of the panelists here with us. So Ms. Ang, the floor is yours. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Selamat sore, Bapak, Bapak, Ibu, Ibu terhormat. Um, first of all, on behalf of Aging Asia Alliance team, I would like to express my appreciations to Bapenas and the organizing committee for this opportunity for me to commemorate the National Elderly Day or Hari Lanjut Usia Nasional. Uh, with all of you here in Singapore um, and get involved in this discussion that's actually very close to my own heart. Um, although, I, as I'm a born Indonesian, my parents, who are baby boomers, are still living right now in Jakarta. Um, I've been in Singapore for the last 20 years and advocating for better quality of life for our seniors around Asia Pacific through our Aging Asia Alliance network. Um, we see, I see that there's uh, close to 600 participants uh, from all over the world today. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with what uh, Aging, Alliance, uh, Aging Asia Alliance do. Um, we are actually an Asia Pacific first industry network of uh, business of aging. We are an independent business network that seeks to unite the businesses, government, and not-for-profit, as, as, as well as mainstream media in, around Asia Pacific together to address the opportunity to support the aging baby boomers population by nurturing partnerships and curating development of solutions. Uh, we are supported by close to 30 global advisory board members, mostly made up of elder care service providers, as well as aging industry influencers such as Dr. Marianne Sao, Chairman of the Sao Foundation from Singapore. Our advisory board members provide us with sounding board for our innovation as well as connect us to the global aging market. Currently, our network has grown to 15,000 over um, 60 countries. So Aging Asia Alliance provides three main support to businesses, government, as well as not-for-profit aging um, industry service providers which include industry training, such as a series of webinars on COVID-19 best practices, which we are currently running. Uh, we also facilitate strategic business partnership through our Alliance networking platforms, and we provide aging sector with market intelligence. In fact, this 15th of June, Aging Asia will be launching our Asia Pacific Silver Economy Report and Projection. So um, before uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over this time for us to hear from our exciting lineup of speakers. Uh, first up, let's hear it from Dr. Dr. Andre Ahmed Zanov. I'm, I'm sorry, Andre, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, Andre is an assistant professor at the Department of Hygiene Graduate School of Medicine, Hokkaido University in Japan. His research area includes mathematical modeling with application of public health and infectious diseases. He is currently a consultant for the National COVID-19 Cluster Task Force at Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare in Japan. Over to you, Andre. Thank you very much. And I need to share my screen. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you very much for your invitation and it's great pleasure to be with you today. And today I'm going to present a small talk about new lifestyle during and after COVID-19. And uh, I am currently as a member of the Japan National Task Force in Tokyo. And we work mainly on cluster intervention uh, methods. And so we try to identify different clusters and then we try to get common features and how we can constrain this epidemic. And today I'm going to tell you mainly about uh, why this uh, 
disease is a bit difficult to control and what we know about it and how we can overcome this at least for a while and to wait until better times. So next slide, please. So as I said, to, today I'm going to tell first about the novel coronavirus, and then I will overview a bit uh, the main concept of Japanese program, which we coined as a 3C, and how we can uh, identify the 3C, which means like crowded places, close spaces, and close conversations. And then whether we can adopt this 3C concept and how we can adopt this in our lifestyle. And at the end, I will overview what we actually do not know about the current COVID-19 pandemic and why we currently require a bit more than probably it's necessary for its control. And next slide, please. So first of all, uh, novel coronavirus 2019 is a disease that is caused by a, a severe acute respiratory disease. Uh, and uh, usually the time from infection to the first symptoms is about five days, but it can be between two and 14 days. And sometimes it starts with fever and dry cough, but often also it starts first with some very mild uh, symptoms like uh, uh, running nose or diarrhea. So as you can see, it, it's very difficult to distinguish this disease from common cold, for example. And that's why it's difficult to say whether you, you have this disease or actually it's a common cold. And in minority of people, uh, we have a severe outcome. It means that after usually seven days, after the illness onset, this person may be admitted to the hospital. And unfortunately, maybe after two weeks, this person may admit to the intensive care a unit admission. Next slide. But what, what is uh, more difficult in this case is that about one half of all cases are actually uh, pre-symptomatic transmission. So it means that even if the person doesn't have any symptoms, this person can transmit disease and would not realize that this uh, infection is so dangerous. And it was known that uh, usually the person can transmit, for example, three, two, or one day before the symptom onset. So even before they're realizing that uh, he or she has the symptoms. And uh, usually the peak of infectiousness happened one day or at the day of uh, illness onset. And also about one third of people, or maybe 20% uh, are asymptomatic. So these people would not even realize that they have the disease, but still they would be infectious to the others. And it was known that the severity affect all age groups. And usually the elderly people, uh, the one we care more, it's uh, more vulnerable and more susceptible to the disease. But very often, as you can see from this picture, that the person, maybe younger one, who does not have the, the symptoms, may bring the disease to the uh, uh, household and then put this elderly to the risk. And next slide, please. And uh, in order to avoid this situation, what we want to know is uh, about, okay, how we can deal with the disease and how we can restrict the transmission. And what we would start is usually to look on uh, transmission uh, routes of the disease. And it was identified that there are three main uh, modes of transmission. The one mode of transmission are uh, result transmission. So it's when the person cough or sneezes and the cloud of particles emits. And it was known that this uh, uh, cloud of particle, it may consist of uh, large particles uh, the ones that are uh, quite large and they probably would fall down on the ground because of the gravity. But also it may consist of uh, smaller particles which would be very, very tiny, but they would be kept in the air for a long time. And uh, the third uh, mode of transmission is through contaminated surfaces. It's when these uh, large particles would fall down on the ground and maybe for some short time, I think that uh, these surfaces can be contaminated. And the surgical mask can prevent some of these uh, events. For example, for large particles, the surgical mask is very effective. And that's why wearing the surgical mask might, might prevent the transmission. And next slide, please. And from this perspective, you can see that if you have the main route of transmission as by large particles, which would fall probably like two meters away or one meter away from the person, then the social distancing that was advertised is very effective. 
and wearing masks uh, is very effective. But if you have smaller particles, then you cannot restrict the transmission by wearing the mask, and most probably the outdoor activity or ventilation would be uh, restrictive for this mode. But sometimes we have contaminated surfaces, and in this case, you might have the uh, disinfection of surfaces. And depending on this mode of transmission, you can see that uh, we may apply different methods, but currently you may also realize that uh, the government uh, imply every particular uh, restrictive measure because actually we don't know much about which one is a mode, and it looks like it's a mixture of the three that uh, drives the transmission of the disease. Next slide, please. And from this, as I, as I said, on the figure on the top, you can see that the person who coughs, and sometimes it may happen during the illness onset, this person may drop the droplets quite near, but if it's small droplets, then uh, there's much higher risk of transmission on uh, longer distances. And next slide, please. And what we discovered from uh, our work in uh, Tokyo about the clusters in Japan uh, is that uh, a lot of people, about 80%, actually do not have secondary transmission. But uh, there are some particular cases when we have clusters, and because of these clusters, there could be some particular secondary transmission in households, for example, to elderly people, to our parents. But uh, this... Uh, events when we have a lot of secondary transmission, what we discover is that they usually associated with some special conditions. And uh, if you, for example, list all these uh, clusters that you identify, then you will see that there are many common features between them. And for example, on this plot, you can see that approximately 80% they didn't have any secondary transmission. But there was uh, the cluster, for example, on a houseboat in Tokyo, where people uh, celebrated New Year, and it was a closed environment with poor ventilation, and this index here probably caused around nine uh, secondary infections. And also we had some uh, outbreaks in fitness centers, and in that case uh, also even more than 10 people were associated with this. And next slide, please. Hi. And, uh, uh, as a summary of this, you can see that uh, when you try to aggregate all the data, in that case, what you would identify is that usually the transmission happens in closed spaces with poor ventilation and crowded places or in close contact settings. By co close contact settings, I, I mean that people may uh, talk very close to each other or whisper on the air to each other, and in that case, there is a higher risk of transmission. And if you want actually to prevent the transmission in the community, and if we want to get a smaller number of cases, you may assume that from this picture that maybe if you avoid these uh, clusters like in a houseboat or in, uh, gym centers, then maybe you, you are restrict and you would control the disease better. So the main aim of the program currently adopting in Japan and I think in other countries is actually to restrict these cases and to try to uh, lowers the risk of uh, uh, having clusters in the community. And next slide. And uh, this 3C, usually what we found that uh, it's uh, uh, connected to the loud cheering or singing or exercise. And you can see that can, it can be a concert or live houses, or it can be sport. But you can also see that in all these cases, sometimes the main uh, people who participate are younger ones, and that's why there is a higher risk that this younger one would bring the infection to the households. And next slide, please. And uh, accordingly, what we saw is that there are many clusters originated in pubs and karaoke bars, in live music events or nightclubs, but also in the gyms, as I said. And uh, very often, this uh, index case is uh, traced to symptomatic or very mild uh, cases and not uh, to severe cases. And after that, we would uh, we usually have the wave of severe cases associated with these clusters. And what, interestingly, we didn't find the clusters that were traced to the public transportation, for example, to trains. And this may indicate that actually the aerosol transmission may take place, but it's not as a don dominant mode of transmission. And this resulted, next slide, please. Uh, 
And next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. And th what this result is that uh, currently in Japan, we recommend uh, the following measures to restrict the transmission in these clusters. And as you can see, what you, we arrived is that we need to ventilate the spaces and also uh, to wear the mask and uh, frequently wash their hands and uh, also uh, try to sanitize the uh, facility equipment, if, for example, it's a shop. And next slide, please. And also to limit the chance of person-to-person -person contact. And I think you all see these measures in uh, Indonesia and they were already implemented. Uh, but you can see also that we have uh, much uh, uncertainty about the, uh, the main modes and that's why we uh, implement different measures that would lower the total risk. And maybe in the future, next slide please. Maybe in the future we'll arrive uh, to this kind of situation. But uh, I want to ensure that most probably it's temporary uh, because uh, there is much uncertainty about the transmission modes and about the disease it's because it's a novel disease and may lead to severe outcomes in uh, some patients. And next slide, please. And this is because uh, here, what I listed, there is a lot of uncertainty. And as, a, as I said, there is a, we don't know exactly the infection fatality rate, for example, of disease. And as I explained before, we don't know the exact route of transmission, the dominant one, because maybe it can be by uh, big droplets or by aerosol. Or also, we don't know why we see a lot of diverse spectrum and clinical outcomes. Some people, they have diarrhea, some people, they have smell of loss. And also, uh, the severity can be quite different for different people. But unfortunately, there is no efficient treatment at the moment, and there is no vaccine. And once they arrive, then this, uh, uh, measures probably would be more weakened. And also we don't know, unfortunately, the exact length of the immunity or the length of the infectiousness. But we know that some disease, some transmission happened before the uh, illness onset. Uh, unfortunately, you can see that there is uh, not so many known things. But uh, what I want to say, and from my simulation, from my uh, simulation and from my study is that uh, many people, uh, when the cluster originated, can be younger people or uh, children who would bring the infection to the household. And uh, this should not be stigmatized uh, because uh, the disease is uh, very similar to uh, common cold or to influence. So it's very difficult to distinguish between this common cold and actually COVID-19. But we because of that, we need to adopt the common measures and actually there should be some kind of cooperation between different generations. And for example, children should bring some precaution measures and also parents should bring some precaution measures. And once we cooperate and once we adopt some rules, I hope that we can control the disease and this would affect the future. And then with uh, more treatment and more vaccine, we will be able more efficiently to control the spread of the disease. And that's what I wanted to say with my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. And next slide. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to respond. And on the last slide, I just showed the map of uh, Japan and the map of Indonesia. And from the map, actually, what you can see is that the most affected areas right now is about is around capitals, for example, in uh, Indonesia, it's around Jakarta, and in Japan, it's around Tokyo. But also in Japan, for example, Hokkaido was affected because uh, all these regions are well connected to the uh, external world and also the kind of hubs for all people living in this country. And that's why uh, what we see at the moment is uh, the effect on these regions. And thank you very much for your attention and any questions are welcome. Thank you, Andre. Um, I think we'll hold all the Q&A for later, um, but that's a very, very detailed presentation. Uh, it's, well, I 20% uh, of the uh, cases are actually, uh, people are actually asymptomatic, so that's uh, 
we need to definitely strengthen some more measures uh, and increase hygiene uh, protocols and standards across uh, globally, I suppose. Um, so now let me introduce you to our next speakers from Malaysia. We'll hear from Dr. Rahima Ibrahim, uh, who is an associate professor and the deputy director of My Aging University, My Aging, from the University Putra, Malaysia. Dr. Rahima is an educator and researcher in aging and human services. She is the deputy director of Malaysian Research Institute on Aging and previously the head of the Department of Human Development and Family Studies, Faculty of Human Ecology from the University of Putra, Malaysia, UPM. As an associate professor at the Faculty of Human Ecology, UPM, she conducts undergraduate course on adult development and aging and postgraduate course on social gerontology. Now let Dr. Rahima share with you more about the elderly care and physical distancing era in Malaysia. Over to you, Dr. Rahima. Hello everyone. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. I am Dr. Rahima from the Malaysian Research Institute on Aging and I'm here to uh, talk on the elderly care. Sorry, okay. Elderly care in Malaysia. Uh, before that, I would like to thank uh, the chairperson, uh, Ms. Elwin, uh, Bapenas, and also uh, IRIA and ADB for inviting me to be in this webinar. Um, uh, I will share uh, my screen later to and begin my presentation shortly. Uh, can, can the uh, organizer allow me to share my own uh, my screen? Okay. Let me see. Right, okay. So I'm here to talk on the elderly care in the physical distancing era uh, and the lessons learned in Malaysia. Uh, my, my presentation today will cover the COVID-19 situation in Malaysia and I will be, uh, be talking to, uh, about the background of long-term care and how aged care uh, is operated in Malaysia. Uh, and uh, following that, I will talk on the COVID-19 event timeline and how the aged care industry has responded to the, the situation. Uh, a little bit on the way forward for key stakeholders. And at the end of my presentation, I will uh, summarize the highlights and some key take home messages for the audience. The COVID-19 situation in Malaysia began on the 25th of January with the first confirmed case. Uh, it was an imported case uh, involving three tourists in China who came into Malaysia via Johor. Then we hear uh, that uh, on the 31st of uh, January, the World Health Organization already declared COVID-19 as a global health emergency. And by 4th of February, we had our first Malaysian case, the ninth case overall, um, involving a 41-year-old uh, male who had attended a conference in Singapore and had a, a contact, physical contact with uh, the participants, but he was later discharged. Uh, the next, uh, the first local transmission was, uh, from a female uh, uh, detected on the 6th of February. And by the 11th of February, we, uh, the Malaysia government had formed a special working committee on COVID-19. Uh, it, it was a joint committee between Malaysia and Singapore and headed by the deputy health ministers from both countries. A very momentous event that happened on the 27th of uh, February, uh, which involved uh, tablik uh, religious followers, uh, I think about 16,000 of them, um, uh, became the largest class COVID-19 cluster in Malaysia. 
And this cluster has generated uh, various subclusters and uh, uh, infected a lot uh, of uh, Malaysians. Yeah? The first sporadic case in which the disease has been found in the, the community was detected on the 12th of March. And uh, the first case that was detected in the east of Malaysia uh, was uh, found on the 13th of March and uh, involving a pastor, uh, a 60-year-old pastor from Sarawak. And he was the first one who perished uh, from the disease of uh, the first patient yeah, with COVID-19 to die in Malaysia. Uh, the COVID-19 situation in Malaysia is uh, monitored by the Crisis Preparedness and Response Centre, the CPRC, uh, which was established under the 9th Malaysia Plan. And uh, as of now, we can see that Malaysia uh, has a total uh, infected of 7,619. The total recovery is almost uh, 80% uh, of 6,083 people recovered. Uh, the current active cases it stands at 1,421 and we have experienced 115 total deaths so far. What is important uh, is that uh, from the slide, you can see that the COVID-19 incidence rate in Malaysia by age group, if we divide by age group, the two uh, major groups infected uh, are, are those in the age groups of 55 to 59 and 60 to 64. While the number of COVID-19 positive cases can be found among the millennials and also the uh, the group of, uh, of people aged between 56 to 59. Yeah? So these are the uh, two uh, high-risk groups that is being attended currently. When we are talking about uh, deaths yeah, from the COVID-19 uh, virus, Majority of deaths happened uh, among uh, the older persons aged between 60 to 79 years. Yeah? Uh, this represents 53% and majority are males yeah? in comparison to females. Now I will be talking about the context of uh, aged care in Malaysia. Um, A little bit of a background uh, in care in Malaysia. A view of the landscape uh, of long-term care in Malaysia can be seen from two axes. The horizontal, the horizontal axis represents the level of care uh, provided by the services and facilities from being uh, from services and facilities providing uh, uh, care. Uh, low level care for independent healthy adults to the most dependent older adults. And on the vertical axis, we have, uh, it, it represents where these, these services and facilities can be uh, obtained either from home, the community or in institutions. So in the first uh, quadrant here, you can see that these services are for uh, are mainly residential and provided for uh, older persons with uh, requiring no or very low level of care. So we have the public. Yeah? The blue ones are in public uh, uh, public services or public funded facilities, uh, which are called rumah sri kenangan. We have ten here in uh, uh, Peninsula Malaysia, two in Sarawak and three in Sabah. And besides that, we, uh, we also have other state Islamic homes, uh, uh, 
similar to uh, pesan trends that you have in Indonesia. We, we call them pondok, where uh, older persons study religious texture, uh, texts and uh, Islamic uh, teachings. We also have uh, rumah sejahtera or pondok sejahtera. These are provided by the uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, and also uh, the old folks home, some are provided by the um, not-for-profit and while others are provided by the for-profit uh, operators. Approximately 370 of them, which, are, which uh, should be covered under Act 506. Yeah? We also have other charity and welfare shelters, including mad uh, madrasa. These are uh, regulated under the state or religious bodies. Yeah? For the dependent elderly uh, who lives mainly in residential uh, facilities, we have uh, Rumah Esan. These are the home for chronically ill older persons. We only have two in Malaysia. And we have hospice services provided by the non-governmental organizations. We have a, a number of nursing homes. 26 of them are licensed under uh, the Ministry of Health under Act 586. And we have public and also private hospitals yeah, for short-term acute care. Then we, uh, on the lower quadrant, we have uh, services, uh, non-residential services uh, involving senior citizen clubs, activity centers, uh, associations, yeah, and uh, neighborhood groups. Yeah? Uh, the, the federal government also uh, gives financial assistance program to older persons. Uh, currently, uh, about 500,000 uh, older persons yeah, are covered under this um, scheme. The, the Ministry of uh, the Department of Social Welfare also uh, provide a home help program, uh, which are run by, uh, through collaborations with uh, non-governmental organizations. Usiamas, uh, some of these organizations provide uh, home health services mainly to, uh, to cater for uh, seniors who are living at home but needing some form of help. Yeah? And the last quadrant here is for non-residential uh, services for dependent elderly, but these are mainly um, Paid services, we have public and, uh, sorry, private clinics, physiotherapy, rehabilitation and dialysis center, mobile care, home nursing and care at home services. And uh, some, of, uh, some families rely on domestic help or maid to care for their uh, elderly parents. Okay, what, what can be said uh, about this landscape is that the, the care Malaysia is fragmented uh, with the uh, public services uh, catering for independent and community based due to the uh, the the deinstitutionalization de yeah because we try to move away from institutionalizing the elderly and hoping that more services will be uh, provided within the community among the private uh, the private service uh, sector yeah, they are providing for the uh, higher uh, level of care uh, nursing care 24 uh, round the clock nursing care and uh, for the chronically ill and dependent older person but most of these services require uh, families to be able to afford yeah the, this uh, this uh, to purchase this these services and uh, the long term care situation in malaysia plays a huge burden on families because not uh, all 
not all of these services are available local uh, in the India local area, and also in in terms of affordability of the services uh, required by families to take care of their aging parents. Sorry, Dr. Rahima, I think we have about uh, maybe two more minutes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the COVID timeline and Asian care response in Malaysia uh, started on the 24th of January. And uh, from that, we moved uh, from in March, we have the workplace guidelines uh, and infection control on March 16. Uh, during the first phase uh, of movement control order, uh, the age, the aged care, the Association for Residential Aged Care Operators in Malaysia, have provided leadership and coordination. And by March twenty first, uh, key uh, experts in Malaysia have worked on interim guidelines and some uh, relief efforts for aged care operators. And uh, the important uh, or momentous event is uh, right at the phase four of the movement control order, which happened from 29th to April to 3rd May, uh, where the COVID-19 testing of aged care centers was implemented. And because of that, yeah, the, uh, the, the residential care clusters in Klang and Petaling Jaya, which had infected 36 people and uh, involved five deaths, uh, has been terminated. And uh, on May 8, until now, uh, sanitization of care centers uh, are underway. Uh, and uh, testing is still un ongoing uh, in the uh, aged care centers. So total screening, uh, currently 279 aged care centers has been, have been screened, uh, involving 11,000 uh, residents, carers and staff and 20% of this, uh, uh, from, the, from those who are screened, did not show any symptoms. Sorry, 87% did not show any symptoms. So the way forward for key stakeholders is to uh, rethink their operational uh, operations and business in order to continue uh, in the new normal and to be able to sustain uh, their operations in the new new realities that you are facing now. Also, in terms of uh, infection control training, to be to be uh, uh, um, uh, deployed to the aged care uh, staff, and uh, regarding the the supply of protective equipments, and we need we need implementation. A plan on how to do this, yeah? how to do the infection control and how to supply uh, the protective equipment uh, for, for aged care to continue their operations. And having said that, the aged care industry needs to rethink their way of doing business. Yeah? And we need to, and we need to uh, get uh, reliable data for uh, informed decision making. The key highlights and take home message from my presentation is that in Malaysia, we are seeing increasing multiple, uh, multi sectoral responses to older persons' issues and challenges. Older persons are now categorized as a high risk group. Uh, and we need to understand the impact of social distancing measures on older persons and the care, uh, oper uh, care operators and the staff. Malaysia has provided economic stimulus package for businesses and assistance and funding for care centers, but uh, we need to, uh, this is an opportune moment to align regulatory industry and residents need. Uh, we saw the role of age cope uh, in, in providing leadership and coordination during this pandemic, and uh, we need uh, other industry peak bodies to step in. Uh, many uh, stakeholders has provided guidelines, uh, FAQ, SOPs, infographics for care operators, and we need uh, uh, to translate knowledge and action in, into actions and practice quickly. 
There are repeated nationwide screening of residents, caregivers and staff of aged care centres. Uh, they are uh, uh, working on the SOPs for daycare and activity centres for the elderly because uh, we need to uh, think of how to operate in the new normal uh, as COVID-19 is going to stay for a very long time. So we need to uh, see how we can resume our daily routines in the new uh, normal. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. I will uh, be happy to take on any questions later. Thank you, Dr. Rashima. Um, so next, uh, we're going to hear from uh, my current home, Singapore, from Ms. Pei Kim Chu, uh, CEO of the South Foundation on how COVID-19 and elderly care is being managed here in Singapore. Um, Ms. Pei Kim Chu has more than 20 years of experience in the aged care sector. She's trained as social worker and counseling therapist and clinical supervisor. She has worked in a team of managed primary care, home-based health and psychosocial care, as well as care management for elders living in the community. She also pioneered four initiatives designed to enable and advocate good health and well-being over the life course and support aging in place. She's also the project leader of COMSA, Community for Successful Aging at Wampo in Singapore. And in addition uh, to leading a team in the foundation work with the Asian Development Bank as its center of excellence. Over to you, Kim Cho. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you, Sawin. Yes, I can hear you very yeah, well. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Pungi, Dr. Maliki, uh, our friends from Indonesia and ADB and, and everybody else, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this, uh, you know, this, um, this webinar. So, my, my sharing is basically very much uh, looking at um, coming from the foundation. And uh, as most of, quite a lot of you would know, the foundation actually runs, um, we run various, various uh, programs, but amongst one of the things that we do is really running a suite of community-based services, uh, you know, for older person. And so, the spectrum of older person that whom we covered really ranges from um, the, the, the independent, the physically independent older person to people who are at the end of their lives, you know, end of life care. So we do cover quite a wide uh, profile of older people uh, in the community-based care services that we run. And so my sharing today really focuses on that, focuses really from the ground, you know, the impact of this pandemic. How is it affecting uh, two levels really? One level is how is it impacting the service, the, the people who deliver the services, the professionals, you know, the care uh, workers who deliver the services in, in, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, this situation. And of course, the other impact is really on the, the clients whom we serve, the clients, the older person themselves, the family members. What are some of the impact? What are we starting to see, you know, uh, on the ground? Because I believe this impact is still evolving. So this is going to be uh, my, my presentation. Can I have the uh, next slide? Okay, it's so just, just some um, dates and, you know, significant milestones, so to speak, in, in the Singapore's management of the pandemic. Uh, we, we have our first case uh, on the 4th of January, you know, an imported case. And by the 7th of February, we've gone into DOSCON Orange. Um, it is a risk uh, identification level, which I will explain later what DOSCON Orange mean. Uh, so we, we went into some uh, starting implementing measures, you know, for, uh, safe measures, you know, within the community, within the workplace. So on the 7th of February, we started DOSCON Orange. And by 5th April, we already seen widespread community transmission, right? Where we get more and more cases. I think as all of you know now, Singapore has now one of the highest, if not the highest number of cases in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So on the 5th of April, we implemented, the government implemented what is known as the circuit, uh, circuit breaker, uh, popularly known as CB, uh, which I'll explain what it means. And uh, come 2nd of June, which is next week really, we would be coming out of the circuit breaker. The government already said that we are going to uh, stop the circuit breaker. And so we're going to move into post one 
or uh, you know, post the circuit breaker phase one, and the government has listed three different phases of how we are gradually going to move back into so-called a new normality. Okay, so these are just some important dates for us to, to kind of indicate, you know, at all these various points, different things were done, yeah? So can I have the next slide, please? So this, this slide explains uh, what DOSCON orange means. And if, if you look at it, DOSCON stands for Disease Outbreak Response System Condition. Singapore uh, started this, you know, started drafting this and, and creating this DOSCON alert levels after our SARS experience 17 years ago. So you, you can see there are four different levels and orange is, well, is kind of uh, more than, you know, it's, it's quite high actually, it's just before red. So when orange kicks in, basically it means that we recognize that the disease is severe, it can spread easily, you know, uh, but not that widely yet. And that is already starting to have moderate disruption because quarantine has uh, you know, kicked in, uh, temperature screening is done, there are visitors restrictions at the hospital, for instance, and and for the members of public, you know, we already need to be more alerted. You know, like for instance, if you have a cold, you'll be given uh, five days MC, you know, regardless of how severe your cold is, or even if you have a cough, you will be given five days MC, for example. You know, and, and the, the, the constant reminders of, of uh, maintaining personal hygiene and all that. So that was DOSCON Orange. So what happens to, uh, our cluster of services when DOSCON Orange uh, kicked in. Can I have the next slide? So when DOSCON Orange kicked in, as you can see, these are all the services that we run in our suite of community-based services. For our primary care clinic, we run primary care clinics that take care of uh, people 40 and above. So that clinic covers a very wide range of people, people in middle age, you know, only 40 years old, but also the older, the more frail elders in their 80s, 90s. Yeah, so it covers a very wide range of, uh, of individuals. Uh, for that clinic, it remains open. Uh, now, first of all, before even that, we, already, we, we started split team. That means basically the entire foundation had the workforce split into team A and team B. And we go on a rotational basis uh, back to the office. So for instance, team A, uh, for the first week, team A might start uh, going back to uh, working from the office, 135, and then team B will, will start, will then work from home on Tuesday and uh, Thursday. And the following week, we will rotate, right? So team B will come to office on 135, and team B will start, uh, you, you know, will stay at, uh, team A will stay at home from Tuesday and Thursday. So we had that split team when DOSCON Orange kicked in. But uh, as for our services, the primary care services remain open, but the focus is really on seeing pe uh, patients with more acute problems and those with high risk. So the, the, the physicians will have to identify who are these people. Because our primary care clinic is by appointment only. It's not a walk-in clinic where anybody can come because they're sick. So we have that. For our daycare, uh, it remains open, but we, because of the split team, we, we started bringing in a smaller number of elders each day to the centre. Initially, the centre, uh, you know, could take in, like, say, 30 people, you know, and, and when, when the DOSCON orange kicked in, the, the number of elders coming to the centre uh, became smaller, half the size, you know, about 15 or, or 16, yeah, and priorities are given to high-risk elders, and for the other elders who are not coming into the center, we will provide constant monitoring over the phone and make home visits on a selected basis. And it's the same for our community care management services. They remain open as, you, as per normal, but we basically, the team were told not to just do phone call visits for what we call maintenance cases. Maintenance cases are, are clients who are relatively stable. You know, they are not, in, uh, are not at risk, not so much at risk. Their condition has already stable. And for those, we will make the phone calls to do uh, the intervention, the, the, the follow, follow up. You know, only home visits are only made for people who are at high risk again. Like for instance, an elder abuse case, you know, or uh, a case where very high caregiver stress or, or that the older person has multiple medical conditions and very unstable medical conditions, those will be the clients that our, con our care managers continue to visit. For our medical home care, that's who take, which take care of, um, that's take care of 
uh, uh, people who are homebound, elders who are homebound and at their end of life, it basically remain open. But similarly, you know, the, the principle is no visits for maintenance, stable cases, clients, and only phone calls and make the home visits if necessary when, you know, for high risk clients. So that, that is also the same for our medical home care. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, just five more minutes I have, so I must go quickly. So I think I won't go through. So you can see, yeah, basically, like I said, during DOSCON, this is what happens, you know. Uh, but our training programs completely stopped, okay? Yeah, so can I go to the next, next slide? So the next slide is, uh, okay, next slide is then we had the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is one level, it's not red yet, but it's one level more severe than orange. And for that uh, purpose, for the circuit breaker, we basically, we were all told to work from home except for essential services. And the essential services are uh, identified by the Ministry of Health, uh, by the government, by the Ministry of Health, by the Ministry of Social Affairs. Yeah, uh, who, are the, who are the services that are considered essential? But everybody else worked from home. So within our cluster of services, uh, we had two essential, considered essential services, and that's our primary care clinics, you know, uh, it's considered an essential service, and also our medical home care, who takes care of people at home. For the rest of the other services, the day centers, community care management services, the counseling services, they're all not considered essential as such. But again, they are, we are able to, the care managers uh, are able to visit clients who are at high risk. And for our daycare, they cannot come into our center, but we continue to visit them at home. And if for elders who must go to a center because the family situation is so bad that they cannot just be at home, the, the MOH, our Ministry of Health, has designated different day centers. You know, I think there's a, class, a small number of day centers that are designated to open and these frail elders can be referred. These elders can be referred to those day centers yeah, during this uh, circuit breaker period. Okay, can we have the next slide? Yeah, so, those, so the same community participation programs completely stop. Of course, training completely stop. And uh, yeah, so this was what, what, what we had during uh, when we had the... Uh, can I have the next slide when we had the... This is the Dalsman Orange. Okay, so what does it mean? Okay, this, uh, these are the insights from our team. That means this is uh, really the impact on our, uh, our own people, our, our professionals, our care workers who deliver the services. Uh, one is Zoom fatigue. I think this one probably everybody can relate to, you know, that you spend the entire day really looking at your screen, talking to people online, uh, maybe sometimes not seeing them, and it, it get, can get very tired at the end of the day. And you do that on a daily basis. And also the other thing we found, our, our teams have found, is that because of the current situation, because we are not able to meet one another and to work together, we tend to meet more, you know. Uh, I have teams who tell me that we do huddles every day now, our care management teams, for instance. They do a huddle every day because they need to keep in touch. They need to know what is happening, uh, you know, what all their clients, what all the clients are, like, are, are, ha are happening to them. And, uh, you, you know, so they need to hear from all the different team members. So they do a huddle every day. And it's done through Zoom, obviously. So that the, one of the things that comes up is really this Zoom fatigue. The other one that is really interesting is um, this idea of I need my team. I think this whole situation, because we, were, we, we had to work a lot from home, we had to use a lot more digital platform, you know, we, the, the, we realized that, hey, actually the team, the, the teamwork is very important. That, you know, there are things that I can't do, but my colleagues perhaps can do, you know, and I need her to give me the information. It, it becomes more urgent. It becomes more... Uh, I, I think people see the relevance of it more, you know, in terms of working together as a team. And, and that's also part of the reason then why there are, there are more team meetings. Uh, the other impact that we are seeing is that this thing called we did each other, it's, not, it, it, it's really got to do with the community because, you know, in a community of care services, there are many different services in the community and any older person uh, will need, maybe will need more than one care services. So during this period, our colleagues also find that they need to really uh, start talking more to the other service providers out there 
Like for instance, you know, our care managers go in and see that okay, this older person, the skin condition is breaking down, you know. And so she, she knows that she will need to work with a nurse, a visiting nurse, a home visiting nurse. Uh, and we have a service like that and to, to come in and take care of the wound. And so there is a lot more communication. There's a lot more meeting together even uh, for case conferences to, to really see what we can all do, you know, to better manage the clients whom we are serving right now. So this sense of, hey, you know, we don't, I just, just don't need my team, but I also need the other people out there, the other service providers out there. And we really need to work together much more. I, I think these are insights that our teams are getting. And of course, the other one is the wonders of machines, you know, as in they also begin to realize that some things actually we, we can do, like, like for instance, you know, um, our counselors have always felt that you, if you want to counsel, you must do face to face. Otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't, um, it, 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 it's not effective. I think with this uh, situation, they have no choice, right? They have to start using the phone a lot more. And I think they're beginning to find, for example, that, hey, actually, you know, it's not that bad. You know, we can actually do quite a lot of things on the phone, through the phone. Same with our other uh, team members. So I, I think the, the, the insight that, you know, the use of machine can actually help us. You know, the, I, the, it's more open to this idea of using machines to, you know, for the communication, you know, for making contacts. I think this is another uh, insight that's coming up. The other one is work-life balance, that because you are online all the time, it doesn't matter what time of the day it is sometimes. So the, and, and also, because we are in a kind of a lockdown situation, uh, Lord, I mean, your kids are at home, your spouse is at home, everybody is at home, right, with you. And so the work-life balance becomes really quite a challenge. Right, so this is um, this is really the impact from from the team on the ground. Can I just have the next slide? Okay, this one this is done by the Social Service Research Network, uh, that is based in the uh, National University of Singapore. This is actually a snapshot, right? As you can see, the data was collected over a, a week. And, uh, and also, you know, the, the who are the people who contributed to the data. But it gives you a sense, you know, of what are the presenting issues, what are the issues you are beginning to see on the ground. Of course, this, this data does not cover older, just older people, right? It, it is across the board. So it is um, families, older people, younger people. But it gives a, I, I thought it, I, I, sh I shared this because I think it gives a good sense of the, what, what are some of the issues that we are beginning to see on the ground? What are some of the impact we're beginning to see on the ground? Because the data shown in this is very close, very aligned to you know, what we are seeing on the ground ourselves. So can I have the next slide? Okay, these are the next slide. This is really the impact on our elders. Okay, so as you can see, you know, there's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of boredom because they can't get out, they can't meet their friends, they can't come together, particularly for uh, elders who are, are into community participation programs, there's still a lot of disconnection as well because they they um they, they 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 can't come out, they can't go to the services that they are familiar with. Uh, they are very much on their own, you know, especially if they live by themselves, you know. Uh, and then you can what we are also seeing is deconditioning happening. Uh, you know, we've seen people who are the frail elders, especially because their buffer is so thin that, you know, for them, they, the, the, the mobility become weaker, for example, you know, deconditioning happens because they sit a lot more on the chair, you know, they don't move around so much, right? Uh, their skin condition, for example, it becomes more fragile, the skins break down more easily, again, because they are sitting so much, you know. Uh, we 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 also seeing some situation where there's more a little bit more hospitalization and nursing home placement that people become uh, like I said due to deconditioning there is um, you know impact the medical conditions you know the the functioning of the person so you know this is just what we are seeing on the ground so it is not um, collected data so to speak but it's very much based on sharing antidotes, you know, uh, what, our, what our team are sharing. But these are some of the things we are seeing. Stress and fatigue uh, from the caregivers especially, 
you know, also the helpers in the family, they have a sense of stress, the fatigue. And what we are, the other thing that we are saying is that if the family already is in conflict, for example, the conflict seems to be tends to be enhanced. And if there's a, a situation of abuse in the family, that abuse also seems to be enhanced. Yeah, because I think you're kind of packed together in in this uh, you know in lockdown kind of situation. Yeah. So can I have the next slide? Sorry, Kim Chia, I think we have to wrap up really yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah. So this this is summarize. just one last slide okay. yeah, because I think this isn't. I mean, to me, this this is really what um, we're getting out of it in the sense that you know. Um, like I said just now, you know, the more important they need to work as a team and not in silo. I think this, this situation really brings home that point. The creative use of technology and really the urgent need to educate our elders and caregivers how to use it because, um, you know, we are saying that they, we try but they can't use it. So it's very frustrating for both sides, right? So this is really important. And also reinforcing the idea of community as care volunteers that how do we utilize the entire community, especially in a situation like this, to, to become that care volunteers to contribute to the care of a very uh, vulnerable group of people. And I think last but not least, but really redesigning a more efficient work process. There are a lot of our work process uh, can be redesigned, you know, so that it's more efficient, perhaps a lot more based on digital, digitalization, for example. So these are, these are just insights that we're getting, you know, uh, it's still evolving, I think, but certainly for us at the foundation, these are some of the, the areas that we, we, we need to think through very deeply and need to look at how, you know, from insights, how do we move into really better understanding, uh, creating a, a plan, uh, a, a different process to support the work that we are doing. I think that's the, the I think that's all I have, right? No more slides, right? Can I see what is the last slide? Uh, Okay, this is just, this one you can get from the website anyway. Come 1st of June is safe reopening, but you know, there's phase one, phase two, and phase three. And phase one is fairly similar to COVID, uh, to the lockdown situation, actually to the circuit breaker situation. We are still going to work split team, you know, uh, only essential service functioning, the other services, mainly about the same. I think we, the entire nation is really watching to see how it goes for the next one month, you know, from in June, before we really uh, move into a phase two and phase three. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim Chu. So next, I'd like to invite Dr. Dina Karishma, who is the policy planner for, at the Directorate of Poverty Reductions and Social Welfare, Bapanas, Indonesia. Dr. Karisma has worked for Bapanas for 12 years and has been involved in the policy designing and evaluation of national programs. Currently, he is working with a team to develop the design of the Elderly Information System, or SILANI, and long-term care. Dr. Karisma will share a proposal from Indonesia of elderly outreach and social protection reform. Over to you, Dr. Karisma. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Sylvain. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you perfectly fine. Thank you so much. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to also to, uh, say hi to other panelists. Uh, we've been um, uh, communicating through emails. I'm glad uh, that uh, this afternoon we meet uh, <clears throat> in this uh, event. So uh, my presentation will cover some topics. Uh, the first one is the current condition of uh, elderly in Indonesia, and then our proposal of integrated elderly care, uh, the design as well as Silani. Uh, I'll explain later what is Silani. And the last, uh, uh, the last coverage will be uh, how Silani will support the new normal in elderly care in Indonesia. So uh, this is the current condition of uh, older people in Indonesia. Uh, we are very fastly uh, uh, reaching, approaching aging population. We have 26 million as Pungi in the beginning of the um, of the program said to us um, that are age uh, 60 plus, and the number will increase to about 43 million in 2030, uh, mostly women and at higher risk of poverty. Um, on the other hand, we uh, also have problem with the economic security of this elderly, only 10.5% elderly currently receiving pension. 25% uh, of those elderly are currently uh, receiving some sort of social assistance, uh, including the conditional cash transfer, as well as food poacher, or um, as known uh, as uh, program Sumbako. 
Um, there are care and services available for the elderly, but only for a few people. Currently, uh, based on the Ministry of Social Affairs data, about 200,000 older people uh, receiving care. So what are actually the urgent needs? Uh, the first one is service improvement. Most elderly care uh, now is provided by family, so we need to find a way how to expand uh, more elderly care as well as improving the capacity and the quality of the programs. We do need to think about expanding economic security, uh, access to social security such, uh, such as pension needs to be enlarged, uh, and especially uh, for uh, the younger population that will be um, the future elderly. Uh, we also need to think about well-targeted individual and family-based social assistance to uh, cover and provide protection to the vulnerable elderly. Um, data is an urgent need. Uh, we currently have data, but only focusing on the socioeconomic status. Uh, for elderly, we do need more information. We do need their health status. We do need um, uh, to know their needs and uh, their social challenges for us to be able to provide uh, sufficient care. Uh, for the elderly. And I, we do think that the, da uh, the data needs to be universal. So not only focusing on the poor elderly, for example, but all of the elderly to understand exactly what are the needs of this population. Emergency responses is also an important thing. Uh, we need social assistance uh, to expand quickly during emergency covering the vulnerable population, including the elderly. And we also need to um, uh, uh, create uh, an, an adjustment, as uh, explained by our previous panelists, of care and services during the emergency situation like now. So um, this would be the uh, proposal, uh, the proposed design of the integrated elderly care. Um, so uh, we have the elderly in the, on, the, on the left hand side and on the right hand side is the whole integrated elderly care system. We do have all of this care now. We have healthcare, primary healthcare and secondary healthcare. We have uh, social care. We have community-based programs like home care, daycare. We have inter other institutional care as well, such as residential homes, but they are not well integrated yet. So we want this to be more integrated in terms of providing services to the elderly. And um, we want to have also, uh, the very key factor of this uh, system is the care hub or the case manager. So uh, with the existence of this institution, elderly will be able to contact the care hub or the case manager, and then they will be able to diagnose what's the needs of the elderly and what kind of care or services that the elderly can get. Uh, and uh, that would also cover uh, subsidized care or uh, a care that's paid by the government, or even if the elderly is able to uh, cover some of the expenses by themselves. Um, this, time of, uh, this type of integrated elderly uh, care uh, cannot run without being supported by good database. So uh, that's why I mentioned in the beginning, we do need a data. And Silani is one of our pilot in Babanas that was conducted to collect data of elderly in several places in Indonesia. So Silani is a short for System Informasi Lansia, uh, which is in English, uh, uh, in English is Elderly Information System. So Silani covers many information of the elderly, the demographic information, for example, location and contact, health condition, uh, disability, mental health, dementia, as well as indicators to, uh, to, um, to inform us whether or not the elderly need caregivers, um, the elderly socio socioeconomic status, uh, the availability of the caregiver, whether or not they have caregiver now, uh, as well as access to facilities. So we are also, we are thinking that this type of data is necessary to help us defining what are the needs of the elderly and in a more micro level, what are the needs of the elderly in a certain region. This data will help the care manager or the care hub, the case manager, I'm sorry, uh, to provide good diagnostic, to provide appropriate uh, uh, suggestion to the elderly, what kind of elderly care they should get. And uh, we also hope that this data will be linked to a much bigger data uh, in Indonesia, it's called DTKS, uh, which is uh, the Unified Database System for uh, Poor Population. So in case the elderly are vulnerable or poor, uh, they will be able to receive some social assistance program as well. So these are some uh, selected results from the Silani pilot. I told you in the beginning that Silani uh, is one of our pilot of uh, the elderly information system. 
Uh, now, um, for now, uh, we are piloting this system in seven villages uh, in Jakarta, uh, Jogja, and Bali, covering about 14,000 elderly. Uh, the participation rate is pretty high. Uh, only about 2% of the elderly that we approach for this data collection refuse uh, to participate in the program. Excuse me. Um, some of the results of the database that we have, this is some of the new information that uh, we, we never had uh, in this level before, is that uh, about 10% of the elderly that we uh, collected data from, they need uh, caregivers to conduct their daily activities. So these are um, uh, the, the, uh, the vulnerable elderly that we will probably need to uh, provide some type of programs or protection. About 43% of the elderly have disability, 17% have mental health problems, and 35% are facing dementia. Uh, in terms of socioeconomics, some of the elderly are still very healthy, and 30% of these healthy elderly, they are still actively working. Um, those who need caregivers, those who are no longer active and uh, less healthy, uh, they financially mostly depend on the family member or government assistance. And uh, surprisingly, 24% of them do not have any income source, any stable income source, even uh, uh, um, government assistance or uh, income from the family member, which is quite concerning. Um, in terms of caregiver, uh, those who need caregivers are mostly female and, uh, and their age is mostly uh, above 70. Uh, about 79% of the caregivers are family and about 12% of the elderly who need caregivers, they don't have it uh, currently. So this is also uh, uh, the, the potential clients for the government to cover, uh, to provide protection. Um, most of the elderly say that they need caregiver and healthcare. Uh, however, the, he the healthier elderly, they said that they need more social activities, including health activities, uh, religious activities, even economic activities, they, they still want to be active in, uh, in the labor market. So um, we think that the pilot that we have conducted in seven uh, villages in Indonesia are quite, um, is quite successful, and we think these are some of the factors contributing to those uh, uh, success. Um, uh, we built, um, uh, the team built the, the, the data collection method uh, using community-based method. Uh, they are approaching people that have lived in the villages for so long, have been working with the elderly for so long. And um, the team is also uh, was also trying to institutionalize the skills, meaning that uh, we want the skills to stay in the community or even in the organizations within the village. We try to train them and we ask them to train um, uh, these other people as well. Uh, there were some communication in the ministerial level uh, that helps, uh, uh, especially since uh, many programs are conducted by different ministries. In the local level, there's, uh, there, are, there are both vertical and horizontal coordination. Uh, for example, in the village level, people are uh, coordinating, uh, uh, service provider coordinating, uh, as well as uh, with the higher level of government. Um, and of course, political commitment of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the region is also a center point of this, uh, this assessment. So um, these are the uh, plan for the integrated elderly care pilot. So the pilot of the CLN is just the first step. The next step is to actually uh, create the integrated elderly care. And um, we start with the CLN because we think that data is important. So these are some of the steps that we are thinking. Uh, first, we need to integrate all of the programs. We have a lot of programs that are conducted by different ministries. So we need to create linkage and put them in the same page and put them into a more coordinated uh, arrangement. Uh, we need the function of case management. Um, currently, probably there have been uh, some type of uh, disinstitution in the village, and maybe there are also some uninstitutionalized skill of uh, case management in the local level as well. We need to make it more organized, especially toward elderly community. The program doesn't, the programs don't also need to be uh, integrated, but they also need to be developed as well. The quality of the program, the, 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 the coverage of the program needs to be bigger as well. Uh, the fourth one is the CLNA utilization. The data that we have collected need to be based, to be the base of our uh, intervention. Our intervention needs to refer to uh, what uh, CLNA told us, and um, we are thinking of developing a CLNA digital platform for that. 
And the last, uh, which is uh, in many time, in many changes, is the most difficult is financing mechanism. Developing sustainable financing mechanism will be the next challenge. We are trying to do that now. If, uh, whether it's uh, contribution based or tax based, that's going to be. Uh, uh, but there, there will be something that uh, has to be uh, established to fund uh, this you know, innovation. So this is the Silani digital platform that I was uh, talking about. This is uh, just a mock-up, so um, this is not the final, uh, the, the final display, but we're thinking to have this. We, we are thinking of uh, having Silani digital platform that is connecting many uh, stakeholders in the environment to support elderly. So this is a more detailed uh, <clears throat> explanation of uh, the initiative. The Silani digital platform in this in the middle is connecting elderly, their family, uh, the community of the elderly, uh, including other elderly. Uh, um, it's also connecting government, uh, the case manager, of course, facilities and services. So uh, we are thinking that Silani um, digital platform would contribute to the new normal in the elderly care because uh, the base of the, uh, of the digital platform is online. This probably will help to reduce the physical interaction that needed by the elderly to get some care. So for example, because this facilitated connection with other uh, community members, peer groups, and other elderly, the elderly hopefully will not be too isolated and will still be able to communicate with their peer groups. And um, since uh, the, 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 the family members and um, the caregivers will be able to connect to the elderly through this platform, it will be easier for them as well um, if the elderly needs something uh, urgent, uh, they will be able to be the first responders that help elderly. Uh, we also hope that elderly will be able to self-register themselves or being helped by the family to register to the system. And once they need something from the government or from uh, the community, they will be able to use the system. The care hub or the case manager will be able to see what's the needs of the elderly and probably do some remote diagnostic and uh, link them directly to the care that they need. The government using this platform will be able to provide information about social assistance or other programs that are uh, conducted regarding emergency responses like now in the COVID-19 or provide even relevant information about uh, maintaining health or new regulation regarding lockdown uh, or guidance and uh, et cetera. And then the last, we hope that the facilities will be also actively involved in the platform, providing information about what uh, kind of services they have uh, and whether or not those services are available, whether or not to, uh, it's safe to access those kind of services. And we also hope that uh, probably some services can also be done from distance. This is still a dream, but telemedicine is now uh, something that is uh, getting more and more possible. So this platform should be able to facilitate that or even uh, facilities can also provide tips, information for family members, for the elderly themselves, for the community on what should be done during the situation, how to maintain mental health, how to maintain physical health and, and so on. So what we are thinking is that uh, we are trying to pilot this. Uh, the Silani has been, uh, the Silani pilot has been done. And then um, we try to move on to uh, the, creating the platform and then creating the integrated program as well. And hopefully this can be uh, something that, um, that will help in this type of uh, emergency. And especially if Dr. Rahima told, as Dr. Rahima told us um, earlier, that probably this will uh, take a little bit longer than we, than we expected, then hopefully this system can help. I think that would be all from me, uh, Ibu. Uh, Sylvain, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Karisma. Next, we're going to move into the uh, panel discussion. So I'm going to introduce two of our discussion today. Uh, the first one will be Dr. Kirana Pritasari, uh, who is the Director General of Community Health, Ministry of Health of the Republic of Indonesia. Um, the elderly health unit, which provide policies and guidelines for elderly and geriatric care, is under her supervision. So, so Dr. Kirana, I uh, look forward to hearing from you. So, thank you, Ibu Silvin, and thank you very much for Babanas for hosting this webinar. And thank you for sharing with us, uh, friends from Malaysia, 
Singapore, Japan, and also the the proposal from the Indonesian government. So I want to share some uh, uh, experience during this pandemic. Uh, for Indonesia, uh, our first confirmed case on the 2nd of March, and up to now we already have more than 20, 23,000 confirmed case. And uh, these uh, infections already happened in more than 490 uh, district and cities. So uh, almost all uh, uh, region in Indonesia already infected by this uh, COVID-19. And the total cases, more than 23,000 and the elderly is about 13% uh, of these confirmed cases. And the data from uh, in the 24th of May, that the death cases in the elderly about uh, the number about, uh, the number about 570 and this about 41% of the number of the death cases. So the elderly become our uh, attention that they have uh, vulnerable and also they have uh, the high risk uh, uh, comorbid. In Indonesia, about 80% of the elderly still living with the family. This is one of the strength that we want to uh, keep and also we want to strengthen the role of the family uh, during this uh, pandemic. So during this pandemic, we strengthen uh, our information to the uh, province and the district health office. Since all the, all the activities run by the uh, local government. Uh, next slide, please. And we, we disseminate all the new information, how to uh, support the elderly uh, living uh, in this situation. So we uh, provide, we produce information uh, and we uh, distribute to the all provinces and district uh, digitally that they need to strengthen, support the family uh, then they can support the elderly living with their in the family. So we educate about the COVID-19 and its prevention. And we invite also, we ask the family to invite a company, the elderly to do the physical activities. Uh, and we, uh, uh, we educate the family how to be a good uh, listener for the elderly to tell the positive things and so on. And also to, to teach the elderly to use the uh, more, more digital uh, communication. So uh, use the handphone and so on. This is one of the problem because usually the elderly in Indonesia, uh, we have problem on using this uh, technology. And the other, Thing that we also modify our services to the elderly. Uh, this is our uh, big challenge since uh, we introduced the, the health post, the POSYANDU, we call it the POSYANDU, the integrated health post for the elderly as a facility to conduct the services and also uh, to have uh, contact with the elderly, uh, not in the health facility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now we have more than 100,000 uh, elderly posyandu. But since the pandemic situation, so we recommend to all uh, district health office, to provincial health office, that we need to postpone these services uh, to the elderly. So we uh, uh, ask them to give uh, more information indirectly through the 
uh, the health cadre to do the home visit and so on. But this become a big challenge for us since uh, the number of elderly is quite big in, in our uh, catchment area at the health center level. The uh, primary care level uh, facility, the Puskesmas, still remain open, but we ask them to do the modification of services. Uh, even now, we already have the program to have uh, different queue for the elderly, uh, different clinics, and so on, but uh, we ask the health center to modify their services to have more, uh, more ventilation area to do the services. Even we ask them if possible, uh, we recommend them to do like outside the building of the health center. Because in our uh, health center level, usually it's quite crowd the services and this is become, uh, make the higher uh, risk for the elderly. And we also uh, teach the uh, health, and health center staff to provide the uh, like telemedicine to give uh, more information using the uh, information using the digital and ask them to uh, if if they need urgent services. They ask, we ask them to have the uh, visitor reg uh, registration online system. So this is modification of services we introduce uh, for the elderly during this pandemic. For the home care during the pandemic period, uh, we also gave some recommendation that they need to apply the health protocol, like to restrict the visitors, and also to provide like the isolation uh, room if the elderly uh, have a health problem and to contact directly to the health services if they need more uh, attention. And Uh, to respond to the uh, Babana's proposal, uh, we really support to have this kind of integrated uh, services for the elderly, since to support this elderly not only to provide the health services, but also to provide the social support for, for them. So we need to discuss more intensively with the other sectors uh, in the government and also with the local government. Since the local government, they have the, the responsibility to provide uh, basic services to the uh, elderly. And in our system, decentralization system, the government at the district level, they have the authority to do, uh, to provide the services for the elderly. I think this is the situation in Indonesia in our uh, uh, big challenge that we need to encourage the uh, community to comply to the health protocol, that they need to uh, have the healthy life behavior uh, at, the, at the home during the, uh, during the uh, during the transportation to the work, but also uh, after that, and to keep the family protected from the risk of the the pandemic, the COVID-19. And we also uh, introduce the telemedicine uh, to provide more information and also uh, can give more uh, attention on the physiological uh, issues, but the problem that we do not uh, have the system, the scheme, how this telemedicine also can support it by the health insurance. 
So this situation uh, need to be uh, overcome and we uh, plan to develop more program and if the integrated health, integrated services for the elderly uh, will be uh, broader implemented in the area, it will be uh, benefit for the elderly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirana. Next discussion will be Dr. Adi Santika, former member of the National Council of Elderly. Is this on? Yes, Dr. Adi, we can hear you. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to thank to uh, Dr. Nas for inviting me in this webinar. And uh, allow me to share with you about my views or my experience based on my empirical evidence in the field. Uh, I try to uh, simplify all the uh, problems of elderly facing uh, uh, the new COVID-19. Uh, As you can see, uh, as you can see, there is a uh, a uh, simple graph or simple diagram that I show you this at this moment. Uh, you can see the uh, first uh, circle, the elderly ADL, and the capability, uh, and so on. And then uh, we call it this the, like the cause effect uh, diagram. So uh, let me brief you uh, uh, what actually what I mean in this graph. Objectively, elderly has a different characteristic between one and another. Therefore, elderly needs to be differentiated by their base living capacity, namely independent elderly or activity daily living, ADL, and elderly who needs help from others as a companion or facilities tools for their uh, daily life or instrument activity daily living, IDL. From these situations, uh, so, uh, we have to know exactly for each group, uh, we have to know about the capability, the health status, their income, and the environment. These categories is the initial stage that needs to be done directly and to be done correctly also, because it will affect towards the intervention efforts for elderly. If this categorization is not done properly and correctly, it is certain that the intervention given of all elderly will not be in accordance with the target, which makes improvement for elderly welfare is from the expected results. So let's move on capability health status, income environment. Two elderly categorizations mentioned earlier basically needs to consider four main domains for elderly, still in the context of COVID-19. The first one, capability to include employment of older people and educational status of older people. We have to know about this for these two groups. And the second one, the health status that includes life expectancy at 60, healthy, a healthy life expectancy at 60 and psychological well-being and today's context conditions. Elderly are very vulnerable regarding to their health equality in connection with comorbidity. As you know that the comorbidity is very uh, clear, it's affected to the uh, uh, infections of uh, COVID-19. Heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and lung disease. And the third one is income security, which includes pension income coverage, poverty rate in all age, relative welfare of older people and income per capita. So uh, again, both uh, elderly ADL or IDL, we should know exactly what their conditions according to these uh, uh, domains. And uh, move, let's move on to the physical distancing and social distancing. If we are talking about the elderly ADL or IDL on the context of uh, uh, new normal, 
we have to know exactly about the elderly categorization based on ADL and ADL, as well as problem it is the exact way to do it in order to facilitate the content policies formulation in accordance with evidence-based policy principles. Now, uh, after we know exactly about the uh, physical distancing and social distancing, uh, the impact of COVID-19 forced everyone to enter the new normal lifestyle. Maybe for my, my uh, views, it's not exactly the new normal lifestyle. Maybe just go back to normal style. Behavior changes is important to clear out normal activities while adding implementation of health protocols to prevent COVID-19 transmissions. One of the health protocols is to do social distancing by reducing physical contact with others. Do you think that it is uh, uh, possible for uh, elderly to do this? We, we, we can see a uh, discussion. Objectively, the new normal implementation needs to consider the characteristic of those who will be targeted in terms of certain groups that are different from other groups. This also applies for elderly. Why elderly? For Indonesia, it is the fact that elderly are a vulnerable group and has a high risk of experiencing a very significant impact in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. In a broad scope, there are four consequences experienced by elderly, namely, I think this is from my observation right now, that uh, one is an increase on social exclusion and isolation which leads to depression, fears, and helpless feeling. The second, uh, the second one is a, a possibility of reduced limit really. You can see, in normal conditions, most of the uh, elderly get supported from their family. But right now, there's a lot of people lay off from their work. So they will reduce uh, to send uh, additional income for uh, the elderly. The third, uh, still the uh, first slides. The third one, only a small proportion of elderly enjoy the pension. Or more than 80% still have no access to minimum income support. And the last four, limited mobility as a result of staying at home activities. Now, if I want to relate it with uh, Andre, uh, uh, Mr. Andre uh, presentations, Ms. Kim Cho and Ibu Rahma uh, presentations, let me make explanations. The impact is felt even more when elderly is faced with rules regarding with large social, uh, uh, what I mean with large scale social distancing, the SVB Indonesia, that pro, uh, prioritize the importance of distancing and social distancing implementation, which has been an effect for about three months since March 2020. Even for the ADL the elderly groups, the impact is still felt by them considering their psychological conditions that they are getting through, which makes this condition is much more harder for the ideal elderly groups. Now, uh, uh, in this regard, actually, I, I, I do have my own questions regarding uh, uh, Dr. Andre's presentations. Because you, uh, you may see yes, three says, close, space, crowd places, and close contact setting. But is it possible to apply for, let's say, uh, elderly, particularly in Indonesia, living with dependence on aid or assistance from others? It's very much needed. I think we mm -hmm. have to avoid it. <laughs> Living with dependence on aid or assistance from others is very needed. Just quote it. In the current pandemic situation, hospital should allow close families companions. We cannot ignore them. This is a big issue for elderly because most of the often experience mental health and behavior problems such as dementia. Elderly who suffer from dementia are exposed by COVID-19 will not only have this for understanding and do precautions act. They will also have difficulties in explaining or expressing their sickness, complaints, and who they feel because of their dementia. It is kind of uncommon that economic burden is also felt by other family members who need to take care for the elderly parents. It is necessary to have information about how much economic burden expenses needed 
given by both government and family for health care during COVID-19 pandemic. This information is needed to support the social protection in the form of social assistance, non-contributory, and social insurance contributory schemes, also national health insurance that needs to be addressed immediately. And actually, I want to learn more from uh, Dr. Rahma uh, about the social assistance and social insurance assistance in Malaysia also. So the last things, uh, another thing that uh, need attention is the education for health care workers in dealing with elderly patients, especially those who are suffering from dementia and also personal protective equipment using can make elderly more stressful and inconvenient. The most basic thing is to depend on the government's ability on how to communicate with the public. Next slide, please. I just have uh, two slides. I just to uh, share with you uh, my view for uh, four priority. The first one, the inclusion of aging of the need of older person in national development policies and programs. Thank goodness, in Indonesia right now, we do have a national medium term development plan uh, based on the uh, Press, Peraturan Presiden or President Decree, uh, de uh, decree number 18, the year 2000, uh, 2020. But uh, this is not enough. The other homework for us uh, right now is how actually for each ministry can interpret or to elaborate more from the National Medium Term Development Plan. For instance, right now the Minister of Health they are de uh, developing a national action plan uh, for elderly. So what we need right now is the national plan of elderly for each ministries to be implemented or to be uh, elaborated from uh, RPGMN or National Medium Term Development Plan. Uh, about two hours ago, actually, we do have a web uh, webinar with the minister, uh, coordinating minister uh, for human and cultural uh, development. He also mentions that we have to interpret what kind of the data, what we need for interpretation of this RPGMN. What we need is who actually uh, give the uh, services, who will receive these uh, services. Now we have to be more uh, 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 careful about this uh, uh, setting the target. I think it's very related with uh, 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 Dinar mentions. Uh, I will support, we have to be careful how to interpret the national medium term development plan in technical manner. The other thing that uh, uh, I want to share with you is a very important is mainstreaming aging into both policy and programs, particularly for provincial regions and district. Even we do have in uh, uh, central government, we do have the law, let's say the uh, Praturan President or Presidential Decree, but in the uh, provincial regions and district, I think it is a uh, very difficult to set up uh, the new regulations. But right now, uh, uh, thank goodness, uh, there is a success story. Even uh, during the pandemic situations, the provincial, uh, uh, the West Java Provincial Government has set up the new uh, governor regulation regarding this uh, uh, older person uh, welfare. Uh, the other thing that I want to share with you is a very important is support communities and families that uh, a family uh, has a distinctive place in Indonesia right now, uh, hopefully forever. It is the most basic social unit with much more of country social and economic uh, life revolving around it. So uh, support communities and uh, families to develop support system which ensure that frail of person persons receive the long-term care, I think in line with uh, Dinar mentioned before, they need an uh, uh, promote active and healthy aging at local level to facilitate aging in the place. And at last, strengthening of intergenerational relationship is very important. And uh, the last but not least is the legal identity for a person is corner uh, for social welfare. Law that are vital to older person are often unclear. Contradictory 
outdated and discriminatory in their impacts is a very uh, a crucial uh, issues in Indonesia. This is the right time to support or to set up the new legal system for all person, particularly in, in extraordinary situation like in the pandemic uh, COVID-19. I think that's all from, uh, from me and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Adi. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kirana. Um, that's very insightful into some of the concern and uh, challenges on the ground in Indonesia. Um, I think I've got about three questions that I uh, kind of picked up from both of your sharing just now. Uh, I think one of the pressing one uh, from uh, Dr. Adi in the area of social assistance for seniors. I think uh, I hear that you wanted to hear the perspective from Malaysia. Um, so maybe we can, uh, we can hear your perspective, Dr. Rahima, uh, what's, what's currently happening in Malaysia uh, and how is the government has been extending social assistance for seniors? Hi, uh, I will respond to that question. Uh, for older persons in Malaysia, we have Bantuan Orang Tua or financial assistance for the elderly. Uh, about Ringgit Malaysia 350. Uh, which uh, which is uh, given through the Department of Social Welfare, and uh, we also uh, okay. We also have uh, social social uh, insurance uh, through um, through pension and. Uh, and also the uh, employment uh, em employee provident fund, and we also have other uh, labor market interventions uh, through employers uh, through employers. Yeah, uh, but we still lack uh, support for families, uh, especially at the younger and late, uh, later stages of life, uh, and and this is impacting on the uh, access to care by uh, majority of Malaysian households. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahima. Um, I've also uh, picked up uh, from Dr. Kirana and Dr. Adi's uh, sharing that there's a similar um, concern with regards to compliance of hygiene protocol, uh, especially I guess in the rural area. Um, and um, maybe the panels will be able to address that, um, what, what's currently being done in Malaysia uh, and how about in Japan and in Singapore? Uh, I might start to, to talk about Japan. So in Japan, uh, we don't do scanning of the temperature and like it's done in China, but indeed we have uh, disinfectant. Uh, uh, so we have some soap and disinfectant and people usually wash. And then if you have a shop, then usually each customer should be decent like two meters away from each other and each customer should wash the hands. So by doing this, we try to minimize the risk of transmission in the community. And maybe because of that, we would minimize also, also the risk of transmission of the disease to the elderly in the household. And uh, elderly in uh, Japan, it's what I can see. Uh, they try to self-isolate probably, but mainly our target is uh, maybe a bit younger, like 50 years old, which looks, from previous presentations that are the, one of the drivers of the disease. But indeed, as uh, what I list in my presentation, we have these rules and uh, Japanese people try to obey these rules and to follow them. So that's it. Thank you. And uh, I think we know that in Japan, masks, uh, putting on masks is quite a common thing, even in the uh, pre-COVID era. Uh, but it, it certainly is something that's quite, uh, quite new uh, for us here in Southeast Asia. I know that Singapore government has been giving up um, masks. Uh, in fact, we've, I think they've been giving up three rounds of masks uh, now to all the citizens. Um, and how about in Malaysia, Dr. Rahima? Sorry, I didn't hear the question, sorry. 
uh, how how has the government been able to support the compliance of hygiene protocol in Malaysia? Um, the uh, there are a lot of uh, guide, guide, guidance documents and also infographics disseminated through the public and also care operators and uh, we recently also have uh, uh, interventions by uh, international agencies such as the World Health Organizations uh, they are trying to set up uh, uh, training and also helping out in, uh, in distributing the, uh, the protective uh, 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 clothing you know, required by uh, frontliners. So, uh, and, and uh, with the cooperation from, from uh, civil society organizations such as uh, HCO, which is uh, one of the uh, leading uh, associations uh, which has coordinated uh, between uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Department of Social Welfare and Ministry, uh, Ministry of Women, in, in, in addressing the needs of the care operators during this pandemic. So we had uh, good cooperation from on the ground from the civil society organizations. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask this question next to uh, Kim Chu actually, because I know that you uh, lead the, the activity of Komsa uh, in, in the community. Uh, what has been done uh, in terms of compliance of the hygiene protocol, especially with, uh, per, with the person uh, that have dementia. Is there any activities? Yeah. So, so I, I think share? for the majority of the elders, I think before we actually went into the circuit breaker period, there's been a lot of um, you know, volunteers going around, uh, our, our, our work or care staff going when they make the home visit to go and you know, also to teach them teach the, the talk to the older person about about hygiene you know about how to wear the mask properly so those are being done i think for people living with dementia that's really challenging because like i I've, I've heard this story um from a colleague of mine you know and she said that they just like this client whom she has absolutely refused to wear a mask uh, but what i understand is that there is a, a way out of it in the sense that if if you have um, an older person who has who lives with dementia and really refuse to wear this mask, uh, apparently you can apply, you know, through ADA, which is the Alzheimer's Disease Association, and to say that this person cannot, you know, will not wear a mask, and you, you can get approval for that, so that when this person actually has to go out of the house, he's okay that he doesn't wear a mask or she doesn't wear a mask. So there are some of those uh, leeways because as you you really can't. I mean, you can't force them, right? Yeah. So those are some of the things that's been done. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I guess a lot of education is required as uh, in both front uh, and the compliance as well as you know the nature of dementia. So at the same time, um, I also Dr. Dr. Kirana was talking about uh, telehealth. Um, sorry, I will spotlight you again, Kim Chu. <laughs> um, because I know that you guys also run some primary care. Uh, I'm just wondering whether there's anything that's been done currently uh, on uh, moving some of the activity, uh, some of this engagement on telehealth. Uh, sorry, I, I was mute just now. So I, I think this this is picking up. That I think there's a realization that this is really one way that we we have to go. But it, it is not so. Um, Easy in the sense because like uh, we tried it out at the clinic. Um, my my colleague, my physician colleague tried it out. So she's basically starting with uh, her patients who are, you know, who are very who are more savvy with the digital platform, you know, who has got more stable conditions, you know, whom she knows that they can communicate over the digital platform, and uh, they you know she she can ask them questions and she can trust their answers so to speak, you know. I think for the, the, the elders who are, um, you know, who have more challenges or maybe a lot more medical conditions, more challenges in, in using the digital platform. Um, that's why I, I mentioned earlier that I think you really need to have this drive, you know, this education drive to, to think about how a plan or how do we want to educate the, the elders, you know, in the community 
on on the use of this platform you know or uh, can we use volunteers uh, to help them out or you know what, what what can we do about it that that's that's one um one big challenge i think the other challenge is probably the the the, the equipment itself because as i understand if again from my physician colleagues that if you really want to do good teleconsult i think you can't i mean of course you can use like what we are doing now zoom or skype but i think it doesn't give you perhaps the kind of clarity or the the definition the high definite you need so i think they and and the privacy you know so i think there are certain equipment that that would enable you to be able to do that and uh, i i think I think AIC is also looking into it as far as I know. So I think there are there, there's definitely the thoughts, but I think some kind of plans forming in my size I can see, you know, and how to we move forward with this uh, teleconsult. Like for instance, the other thing is also equipment. If I'm doing teleconsult with somebody with uh, diabetes or hypertension, but they need to have the machine as well, right, to measure their own blood pressure. Otherwise, how do I know? I mean, how, how are they going to tell me? So I think there are all these conditions that needs to be there before, you know, um, effective teleconsult can happen, you know, especially from a clinic perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I do see that as an opportunity there for some of our, I guess, technology uh, yeah. business partners to, to get engaged in this area. Yeah, Certainly. definitely. Although economy has been a bit slowed down, uh, or not just a bit, but I think there's uh, opportunities uh, in the area of healthcare with, in this new new normal. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Kim Chu. Um, Dr. Rahima, do you anything to add on, on the area of uh, dementia uh, engagement um, in the community as well as in telehealth? We are still... Uh, uh, uh underway in terms of uh, testing for telehealth in aged care but uh, the the Ministry of Health have has provided some initiatives to help the elderly within the community you know in terms of medi uh, delivery of medication uh, uh, through online uh, they can they can pick up the medication uh, via uh, uh, Online, they, they can do it online and then receive it through the uh, through uh, delivery, and also uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information being disseminated uh, through um, through uh, SMS, you know the and also uh, we can follow the the, the daily updates on COVID nineteen on Telegram. Uh, of the Ministry of Health, so that's how we have uh, we have kept uh, the information uh, uh, reliable within the community. Yep. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can uh, throw this question to Andre now um, on the area of telehealth because we we understand that Japan has started to uh, now fund uh, telehealth, uh, starting from I think. Uh, last year uh, in some cases for seniors. Um, so maybe is there anything that you can add on, on, the, on the implementation of this and uh, any thoughts on dementia uh, and how to manage a uh, person with dementia during this time of COVID-19? Uh, I may uh, uh, assume that uh, many people, uh, we have a hotline for uh, COVID-19 and many people they can call and they can uh, ask any questions and uh, this includes also elderly uh, and it's what I what I heard about the strategy from Japanese government uh, as I said about before about uh, hygiene and other rules it's mainly we do some kind of proactive uh, measures it means that uh, the facilities usually advertise and they uh, put some information whether people need to follow the social distancing and uh, in that case, uh, there is no way that people would reject and they would just follow these instructions. And this is one of the, uh, one of the lines that I, I put in my presentation that actually all facilities need to do this proactively and to raise some awareness. But uh, indeed, we have, for example, in our case, we have a special Twitter where we put all information for public. 
and also the hospitals they have uh, more friendly information that uh, people can go to the website and just check uh, unfortunately i'm not aware of uh, how people exactly deal with dementia patients uh, i assume it's difficult everywhere but it's tough time <laughs> so, so. and that's it Okay, thank you. Um, does the discussion has any other maybe questions at this point? I think we have time for maybe one last question from either Dr. Kirana or Dr. Adi before we move on uh, to opening the questions from Slido. No? I mean, uh, I'm, I might add just, uh, it's very nice to see in uh, Indonesia that there are a lot of elderly people who actually live with other family members and also with three generations. And uh, that you have uh, about 10% of people living alone. It's, uh, of course, not small, but it's still there are majority of people living with someone. And I think it helps a lot for elderly to overcome this crisis and to, to become more, more strong. In, in this mm. sense. Yes, indeed. Yeah, um, and I guess um, there's a more pressing need now to be innovative uh, and and you know, a sense of community uh, building as well. Um, on that note, actually, uh, I think one of the things that we noticed the most um, during this period of uh, lockdown or um, MCO in Malaysia, they call it, or uh, secret breaker um, is actually the impact on uh, the elderly, the largest impact on the elderly is probably social isolations. We see that around the world as well. And it's a very sad result uh, of this COVID-19. Uh, in the recent webinar that Aging Asia run, we, we learned that from uh, research from University of Tokyo has made evidence that actually um, the social isolation uh, impacted the frailty score uh, a great deal. In fact, uh, people that is um, socially isolated has a very, very high uh, frailty score in comparison to those that are participating actively um, in the, with social and cultural uh, as well as being active uh, phys physically. Um, so I can the panel maybe share what type of uh, activities that can help to create social interaction and engagement uh, during this period? Uh, yeah, maybe I can say something. Um, we we did various things. Um, for, for the very frail elders, we really try to continue to visit them as much as we can, you know, uh, with our our care staff. But unfortunately, volunteers cannot go in, so, so they, they can't. Um, for the ones that are more physically active, actually we tried to, uh, for instance, we, my colleague started a WhatsApp group with them. You know, these are the people who come for our participation programs. And so they started a WhatsApp, a chat group on WhatsApp because they knew, they knew how to use that. So they checked in every day. They talked to each other using the WhatsApp group. We tried to use Zoom at one point, um, but it was very challenging. Um, they, 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 they didn't really try to figure it out. And we couldn't be there to, to teach them, so to speak, you know. So, so those, those are some of the things. So I think at, as of now, a lot of it is through the, um, the telephone, the WhatsApp group. Uh, I think AIC, together with um, some other agencies, have also produced um, TV programs for the elders, you know, during this period in particular, programs in dialects, for instance, because uh, of most all our programs are really either in English or you know not in dialects anyway in, in the Chinese dialects. So in the different languages, you know the dialects, the uh, in in Malay, in Tamil, you know. So so AIC produces a suite of those programs so that the elders can can um, turn on the TV and watch them and and you, you know um, more current kind of uh, programs. And I think they had famous uh, comedians perhaps you know hosting the programs for. For example, so they're doing that, and also they uh, develop a lot of um, resource materials. Actually, AIC developed a lot of resource materials for people who are care staff, also for the family members. You know how you can ideas about what kind of activities you can do with the, the elders when they're at home together with you. So those are some of the the, the things that that was done. I am not sure how 
effective all these are, you know, I, I, I think we, th this is, of course, another area that we really would need to look at to understand whether this worked or not, and otherwise, what else can we do, you know? Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, AIC is Agency for Integrated Care, which uh, basically uh, coordinate all the care for seniors. Uh, and also uh, they, they have an office uh, called the Silver Generation Office um, that also do actively uh, care referral uh, from, the, from the community to service providers in Singapore. Uh, thank you so much for that, Kim Chu. How about uh, Dr. Rahima? Uh, is there anything in Malaysia that you guys are doing uh, differently? That our they can be shared. Um, for Malaysia, I think one one key uh, feature is that we are doing testing in aged care centers, so that has kept the infection uh, out of the residential care facilities and and also um, uh, you know um, making the elderly safe, uh, elderly who lives in in residential care facilities safe. So I think that is the major highlight that uh, that we have uh, uh, done so far in terms of the Malaysian experience. But uh, for the old, older persons in the community, we need more uh, more interventions, especially those who are living alone or living uh, with uh, spouse they may not be able to access the care that they need during this uh, social distancing era. And, uh, or they may, they may have uh, children coming uh, uh, to, to provide support uh, from time to time, but uh, because of the restricted movement, they might not be able to access that uh, familial care as well. So um, I know that uh, members of uh, family members have tried to keep in touch through um, uh, online you know uh, online applications such as uh, whatsapp or zoom uh, but it does not really uh, compare with you know face-to-face -face interaction and the hugs and uh, the things that you can do together with the elderly but this is uh, the situation that we are facing now and and the family uh, the impact of the social distancing on elderly, especially those who are living alone and uh, who are living with their spouse, who you know who may be who who may need some help as well in the home, uh, we have to uh, uh, think of their situation and 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 try to provide uh, support through the neighbor uh, as neighbor neighborhood associations or local NGOs. Thank you. Uh, Andre, anything to add? Experience from Japan? Uh, yes, and in Japan, what I wanted to say is that also elderly people look a bit more independent, but of course uh, the situation is a bit uh, difficult. And we did have some outbreaks in uh, uh, elderly care facilities. And unfortunately, we could not uh, shield those people, and we still have even ongoing clusters, for example, in Hokkaido. And uh, this is one of the issue in Japan, and we, we try to manage this, but a bit difficult, yes, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, Thank if you. I may go so in. Yes. Please. So, um, thank you. Um, this is just um, maybe a, a source of a new discussion, but I'm, I'm trying to respond this question from a different angle. So in Indonesia, as uh, Dr. Andrea said, um, most of uh, most um, most of elderly actually um, live with the family, and this is um, um, this is interesting because apparently living with families can also create um, a depression and mental health problems, especially if usually in the normal uh, situation you have your own space, you have your own personal time, and then suddenly it's quarantine, everybody is staying at home, and then you will be with your whole family all the time, uh, you lose your personal space, you lose your personal time. So that can also be potentially source of uh, a depression and uh, maybe not depression, but mental health problems. Um, in If the family members are facing hardship, for example, they are staying at home not because uh, of the, only because of the pandemic, but also because they were um, 
they were losing their job, for example, that would also create the, the stress because the elderly would then um, um, feel insecure about their economic situation, whether or not they will have enough money to go on and everything. So I think this is also uh, something that is um, can be an, an, an equal challenge for uh, both elderly that are living by themselves and elderly in Indonesia, they are mostly living with family members on, or probably even extended family members consists of uh, many generations. That could also be uh, uh, something to, uh, to think about. Um, I think it's also important for, um, uh, for us, uh, for the government, for example, to provide some guidance or even tips and information on how to deal with the situation for elderly that are living by themselves, how the community could cope and then help the situation. And for elderly that live with the family, for family to know as well that uh, there, there, are other, uh, there are older people in the, in the house and they, uh, that everybody should be, um, uh, should be mindful and, and provide everybody in the house an like, opportunity to have their own personal space and personal time. I know this is a luxury that, that, that not all of Indonesian families would have, but uh, for those who can, can do that, that's probably gonna be uh, helpful. I think that's all for me. Thank you, Dr. Dinar. Um, actually, since you are on the, on the spotlight now, I'd like to throw this question, um, which is from the Slido, the impact of the digital divide in Indonesia on social isolation of elders in a community, especially in the rural area, I'm assuming. Uh, and where does, where, is there an opportunity to address this? Um, as also with Silani, uh, I guess the, the issues of digital divide is something that has to be addressed. Any comment uh, on exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it is something that we are um, dealing currently now. Um, uh, the context is not always COVID, but we are also uh, we also have so many um, social assistance programs that are uh, delivered based on a digital platform, and we are now facing uh, challenges in in uh, doing the delivery mechanism. Uh, as good as um, um, equally good in many regions of Indonesia. In some regions, uh, there are cha uh, challenges that uh, this type of delivery is um, is is not going very smooth because of uh, the um, the lack of signal or even uh, um, the lack of connection of um, uh, 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 internet and, and things like that. I think that is um, I think that is very valid. I think what um, I, I may be wrong, but since now most of the um, COVID-19 cases are concentrated in the city, so uh, we we could say that uh, most of the elderly in the city they they are well connected to the um, uh, to the digital div um, digital digital gadgets and um, having internet connection and everything. Um, um, elderly in the rural area are probably those who are not very well connected to the G digital world. But uh, well, fortunately, maybe they are also less exposed to the risk of the COVID-19. Um, but I know that this is not uh, an answer or a solution uh, to this uh, situation. But uh, we do now, at least in the framework of the social uh, protection and assistance reform in Indonesia, to expand uh, the coverage of signal, for example, and expand the use of, uh, of digital device. Uh, one thing that is probably helpful is that we have uh, nationwide social assistance programs that have facilitators and deal with the community directly. And all of them are uh, equipped with a device, a digital device. So even if there's a, a lacking of a connection among the community, at least there's, there will be a facilitators that can probably bridge uh, the situation. That's for me. Thank you. Um, so one of the biggest impact on COVID-19 is certainly is on the economy. Um, so one question, actually, this is my own question that I wanted to hear from the panel. How do you think we can help the vulnerable seniors' uh, livelihood, especially in Indonesia, that some of them are uh, basically working um, on a, 
day to day basis. So once the job, uh, once they can't work, they don't have any income. Um, is there any thoughts on this? Any new job creations, perhaps in Singapore? We see uh, Singapore Airlines crew that's been grounded uh, are now being offered different career tracks as uh, you know care team, uh, part of a care team in the hospitals or social dis- safe distancing officer or ambassadors. Uh, in Japan, we also see new uh, jobs. Uh, a lot of care workers, a lot of new care workers uh, interested into the sector, coming into the sector because of the traditional economy uh, currently uh, in, in a slump or in a, in a slowdown. So um, is there any ideas or thoughts surrounding new job creations and how we can help, how the seniors in Indonesia can get engaged? Um, from your sharing earlier, it looks like there's quite a number of proportion of Indonesian seniors that are still currently working. Thank you, Silvin. Yeah, that's um, that's also another concern because um, for now we do have programs, uh, but um, I think this is also a challenge that is uh, faced by um, Indonesian people. We need to start, and this is also mentioned by, by Dr. Uh, Adi Santika previously, that we need to start uh, mainstreaming uh, the issue of um, older people. Uh, because uh, we are now still thinking that Indonesia is a young population dominated by working age population. So uh, most of the programs are geared toward the working age population. Uh, we do have some programs to um, to help uh, the economy to pick up uh, for the um, uh, for the uh, population uh, that are engaged in the informal economy. Um, we um, we have uh, um, uh, credit programs for them. And uh, during this COVID-19, we, we try to, uh, um, uh, to make it easier to access these credit programs and also to make it easier for, uh, for, the, uh, for the creditors to, um, um, to have some uh, uh, relaxation in terms of uh, repaying their loan. So uh, we do think if uh, those uh, active elderly are working in the informal sector and they need loan to probably uh, uh, um, uh, help their business during the situation. Uh, this uh, this type of program can um, uh, can be used. So this type of program is targeting the whole population rather than only um, elderly M-O-H. population. M O H. Excuse me, Dr. Hima. Sorry, uh, sorry. That's fine. Um, so um, we think that um, we need another. Um, some type of uh, of catalyst uh, of activists uh, in the community level who will advocate the right of the elderly to let them know that there are this program that they can access. To let uh, 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 people that are working with the program know that there are elderly that can be targeted through this program. I think this type of activism is also important uh, in the community level to help uh, the government programs to reach to the elderly as well. Uh, we cannot hear you, Ibu Selin. Sorry, I do have one question from Slido on that. Um, basically, how do you reach uh, the elderly in the uh, lower or middle income class for, for the elderly living or elderly living alone who is, yet, who is not yet covered by this elderly program, especially in the current situation? Just to, leading up, to lead on to your um, you know your comment on the on the uh, the programs. So the um, the the data collection uh, mechanism um, is um, is a is a bottom up system where uh, people in the village level or even lower than village level can uh, can propose uh, to uh, the higher level of the government on who can get the social assistance programs, uh, especially regarding the uh, social safety nets programs that we provide for the uh, for the COVID-19 impacted. So um, um, assuming that these people have good knowledge on uh, who are actually the people that they are serving in their regions, they should be able to uh, provide help and then uh, uh, proposing uh, um, uh, older people that are probably in the region and they need social assistance to get um, um, uh, to get the, the social programs that we are providing. However, currently in this type, 
in this final situation, uh, the government um, is unable to work by themselves. Uh, we do need help from the community and, uh, and, 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 and society as well. We do need your activism. We do need uh, uh, advocacy uh, that will help us to, uh, to know, that will help uh, uh, government uh, local level governments to understand the uh, the actual problem in the region uh, to actually find people that are probably now uh, quote unquote not visible to the government so uh, I think it has to be a cooperation between both of government and then uh, the society thank you I think we have time to for only one last question um, again leading up from the, uh, that conversation just now um, we know the recent webinars that we run uh, as well, we learned uh, that in China, there's, because of COVID-19, um, there's been a lot of focus uh, on actually uh, senior living community. Um, they find that senior living community actually are able to uh, uh, you know, provide a more secure space and healthier and um, more, uh, I guess, more, more supported environment for the elderly, especially those that are living alone or empty, they're facing empty nesters. Um, so this, there's this question uh, on Slido on uh, how to implement new normal long-term care facility. What would that look like, um, especially with long-term care uh, facilities have limited resources um, and with government funding probably will shift uh, slightly from, uh, you know, from long-term care to other area. Um, but is there a business business opportunity here for uh, you know PPPs or for um, uh, private sectors or not for profit to come in and support that? Uh, what does um, the panelists think about it? Uh, I must say a few words. Uh, in my opinion, to shield uh, elderly homes is very difficult because the uh, uh, community is very susceptible, very vulnerable. Uh, one optimistic scenario would be somehow to control the outbreak uh, externally and then hopefully if we have less cases then uh, it's less likely that this uh, disease would would jump to the healthcare uh, community for elderly people and this is uh, in my opinion this is a problem and kind of open question not only for our countries but also for europe or us where they've had a lot of problems exactly with this and so that's it uh, yeah maybe I, uh, well i think for us we, we're still really you know collecting the, the understanding of the impact uh, as it's evolving but i think we're also beginning to see like for example our day center for frail elders how do we redesign that the, the, the programming of that day center, how do we run that day center differently, you know, uh, taking into consideration or the need for the safe distancing, you know, the, 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 yeah, especially safe distancing or small group activities and not having large group activities. So we, we are really rethinking really about that, that do we need, um, even for day centers, we will bring, we will still, the elders can, will still come to the center, but in smaller groups. And how do we redesign the, the space? You know, that's one. Uh, do we need a bigger home base uh, component, even to a day center, where we need to do more visits? You know, we actually will need to visit them at, at home as well, you know, and not just, um, just at the day center. One of the things we find that with, with this change in the, you know, in, in this uh, implementation of all these measures of this safe distancing, of these safe measures. One, one of the very key component that, the, that our day center, the, frail, the day center for frail care is, is one of the key component is, is lost. And that component is actually the eyeballing factor. Because when frail elders come to our center, they, they come say on a, a daily basis, at the center, there are people who, who will kind of, what we call eyeball factor, you know, we, we really check them out and see how they are doing. And, and if we know, if you know the elders very well, you will be able to see a difference from day to day. If they come in one day, they are very happy. The next day, the mood seems very low. If you know the elders well, you will be able to pick that up. And that's to us is very important because that could indicate some change in their current situation, you know. So with, with, 
like in these two months, that's completely lost. And, and we find that, you know, um, that, that is so crucial, you know, to support a, a frail elder, especially to really be able to eyeball them very closely. But I, I think, like I said, we, we are thinking, rethinking. We haven't got the answer yet, but certainly um, we, we feel that, you know, community-based program will still be important because that's where most people want to live anyway. So, but how do we do it? differently. I think that, that is so, though there's no answer, but it's a lot of rethinking, I think, yeah. Thank you, Kim Chu. Uh, Dr. Rahima, anything else to add, perhaps? And Dr. Dinar yeah. as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, we all have to think about the exit strategy for aged care, especially uh, elderly care in the community because uh, as, as Ms. Pei was saying, it is where the elderly wants to live. And for aged care operators, yes, uh, we, we must now review the business and also the operations. And for staff and volunteers who have, who have, who have been working on site since the um, movement control order, they are facing you know, social isolation and, and low morale from not being able to go back to their own family. So, uh, how do we deal with these kinds of uh, situation? And also in terms of testing for infection, we have to do this repeatedly to ensure that the older persons in residential care facilities will be protected and not just, you know, uh, not uh, as a one-off uh, initiative, but ongoing uh, and repeated because we need to, uh, to protect the vulnerable elderly in the facilities. And for staff and volunteers as well, new modes of working will will be uh, guided. You know, we they need uh, SOPs, guidelines uh, to to be able to manage the situation. And for older persons and family, uh, in terms of managing the social dis distancing and how to stay connected or over, uh, you know, virtually would be useful. Uh, but these are all. Uh, being uh, being discussed right now, and and we still do do not have the the answers for all these questions, but of course uh, we are learning along the way mm -hmm. uh, uh, throughout this pandemic. That's all from me. Thank you. So I guess that's one of the reasons why uh, webinars like this is useful to, you know, to put our heads together and listen from other, each other. Um, Dr. Karisma, any last thoughts on this before we close on the panel discussions? I'm sorry, I ran out of time. Uh, I, I overrun about five minutes here. Um, that's fine, Bu. Uh, thank you so much. I think um, since Indonesia is still developing the, uh, the LTC, uh, system. Uh, we do not have a lot to say here, but um, Dr. Kirana earlier, Ibu Dirjan, has uh, shared to us uh, some of the uh, guidance provided by uh, the Ministry of Health uh, to conduct uh, safe elderly care in, um, in the nursing home setting. Uh, but um, this is a, a very good opportunity to learn from uh, Malaysia and from Singapore and from Japan as well on what uh, they have been doing in their country. And uh, hopefully when we are able to expand uh, our system um, um, uh, you know, yeah, uh, to, to provide more coverage, we will be able to um, uh, implement those kind of strategy as well. I think what is important now is to really enforce the guidance that uh, the Ministry of Health has provided uh, to the nursing home facilities, uh, both that are managed uh, privately or publicly under the Ministry of Social Affairs. And uh, that is uh, the next homework for us, um, and uh, to ensure that uh, the um, the resources that they have will allow them to to also uh, implement those um, uh, implement those protocols. I think that's for me. Thank you. Um, does the discussion have anything else to add at this point, or? If not, I'll hand this time back to uh, Ibu Shafira. Okay. 
Thank you so much, panelists. I think one thing that's uh, there's common, the common thing that we can derive from today's discussion is that the new normal is not going to look like what we used to know or what we used to experience. But um, there will be a lot of innovations uh, required to, uh, to 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 come together and come up with solutions. And um, yeah, so look forward to more of such uh, conversations. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ang and all of the panelists for the great discussion. Very insightful. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to inform you um, that the materials of the presentation from the speakers uh, can be downloaded by clicking uh, bit.ly slash elderly materials with S. And now I'd like to invite the Director of Poverty Alleviation and Social Welfare of Bapenas to deliver the closing remarks. Dr. Maliki, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Ibu uh, Budesma. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon, uh, distinguished speakers and as well as the participants. I would like to uh, thank you to all the wonderful people, uh, Pak Pungki, Ibu Dirjen, Pak Adi, uh, Dr. Andrew, uh, Dr. Rahima, uh, Dr. Kim Cho, and also Dr. Jina, who spoke and uh, presented today. I guess all the knowledge and uh, experiences uh, that uh, have been given have enriched and strengthened uh, our grounds to formulate uh, the next policy especially on the uh, elderly for living in the new normal. And as also, I uh, we really appreciate uh, for Ms. Silwin, who has done a very wonderful job uh, to moderate the session. And uh, we are looking forward for our, our next uh, productive uh, collaboration. Uh, next, we also thank uh, for all the participants uh, of this webinar. Uh, for your information, uh, this webinar has attracted a lot of uh, parties. Uh, as uh, for the last minutes, the partic uh, participants who already registered has uh, reached around 2,600 uh, people. So uh, 10 of the participants, 10% of the participants uh, come from uh, neighbor countries such as Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, also the Philippines and also from far away, such as United States and uh, also the United Arabs of Emirates. Uh, most of the registrars uh, come from academic backgrounds, uh, which is around 52%, and most of them uh, has medical and also nursery backgrounds. 12% is uh, from the government, and the remaining are from NGO and also the private sectors. So we, real, uh, we really appreciate uh, for the positive response. But uh, in the same time, we also apologize for the limited space that we have uh, because uh, we only have like 500 uh, space for this webinar. Hopefully the YouTube uh, streaming channel can compensate the disappointment. I saw that uh, there is more than uh, 660 viewers uh, in our uh, YouTube channel as well. So to, uh, to close uh, this webinar, uh, let me uh, briefly jump into implication learning from other uh, countries' experiences. Uh, there are about uh, four elements uh, we need to follow up. First is uh, the adaptive and more inclusive social protection. So this is including uh, the elderly as one of the most vulnerable population to be one of the main target for the social protection. And then the second one is community empowerment uh, and participation to support the elderly for transitioning the, to, the, to the new normal. Uh, there are ways, I guess, to stay safe and uh, physical, uh, physically distant without being isolating. And communities uh, is the key. Uh, communities uh, with uh, living alone elderly in, could keep in contact and communicate with them, saying hi uh, or doing a simple checking uh, from a safe distance, of course, uh, would make a very much difference for the elderly. So let them know that the community cares for them and is ready to help if they need anything, including medical attention. Third is data. Completing and also uh, complementing data by building universal data of elderly. I think it's one of the strategy for more inclusive policy. We need to initiate the development and we believe that uh, we need uh, 
full participation from all the stakeholders. Fourth is technology innovation. Technology uh, made all possible. The development of technology able communication will be the key to be more productive elderly. So it will be possible for us uh, in the nearest future to use this technology to fulfill the needs of the elderly, including uh, at the health sectors, social sectors, communication, and also more productive active activities. So Ibu Dirjen, we are looking forward for implementation of telemedicine to fulfill the elderly care. So combining with all the four elements, we will be able to reach through this pandemic. So lastly, we would like uh, to say again, happy birthday to our elderly population. As last year, Indonesia is officially aging nation. And yet, we still learned on how we can make you, the elderly population, living in more comfortable, dignified, and healthier life. A special thanks to our parents, your bravery, patient, and wise during the pandemic COVID are the strength for us to rebound our nation in a new normal life, to be more productive. Again, thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Maliki, um, for the closing remarks. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of the event. Um, hopefully, this webinar has delivered beneficial uh, information to all of us, and we will be able to put these lessons into actions. Once again, I'd like to ask for your help um, for, part for your participation in filling our post survey, which will appear after you leave um, the webinar room. Uh, and we would like to thank you for your kind attendance and your active engagement. Until next time, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.